Hey, yo, what's good, what's good, what's good? Welcome to Reflections of a DJ, the role podcast presented by DJ City and Beat Source. I am one of your hosts, DJ Crooked. We got DJ Never here. Yo, 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 what up? We got Jamie the Great. Yeah. And so we got a special, very, very special guest. Yep. You know, he's a, a certified GOAT, right? We say that. Yeah. Like, he's yeah. a- Definitely. You know, we have a, a certified GOAT on, a, on the podcast today. I'm, I'm a little nervous sitting next yeah. to this man. It's like legend. legend. I, I was, I was, legend right I, I there, was man. nervous picking him up. I was yeah. like, ah. This is like legend status. Yes, like, you know, absolutely, man. In the last 25 plus years, you know, he's broken records. He's made such an influential and substantial impact in our industry, you know, mm -hmm. from the DJ craft itself to music. Yep. And, you know, he's, you know, the youngest and first Canadian winner of the DMC at 15 years old, five time champion. First to win actually all three major competition titles, DMC, ITF, and Vestax. He's a founder, owner of Fool's Gold Records, mm -hmm. the Goldie Awards, one half of Duck Sauce with Armand Van Helden. And, you know, once the DJ to Kanye West, not currently, but back no. in the day. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> back, er, early but on. Back in, but back in the day. And, you know, we, we actually had him on the podcast years ago. <laughs> I almost forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. Years ago. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it, was a, it was a Twitter battle with him and Rathacon. We could talk about that later. Mm -hmm. But we're happy to have him here. We're very honored to have him here, especially mm -hmm. after his set for the first do-over in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. You know, legendary yeah. shit. Yeah. And, we, you know, we were there to witness it all. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's an, it's an honor to have you. A-Track in the Thanks. building was good. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Th <laughs> yeah. Uh, not not only after DJing the do for, but mostly DJing in the heat. It was really hot. It was like one sixteen. And, and, was was and he was it's wearing like full camel pants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. You I, don't you don't expose your legs. I don't expose my legs. legs. <laughs> well, that's company policy. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> no it's matter good. where he's at. Yeah, yep. it's good to know. So you don't go on vacation and shit, and then do like I don't know shorts. Oh no no yeah. I, I I do wear shorts, but not on vacation. At, uh, I w you know, I would even say that when I do go on vacation. And I do wear shorts. That w that's what makes me feel like I'm on vacation. Okay. Because that ah. symbolizes that I'm not in A-track mode. Right. Where the, An A-track mode. Where the, where the legs don't get seen. So you would never DJ <laughs> in shorts, ever? I, I mean, never say never, but <laughs> here to four, you know, <laughs> thus far. You know, I'm thinking back in the day, because there, there was like these, there's like A-track looks. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, man. So there's like the fitted A track, right? Uh -huh. The fitted cap A track. Yeah. yeah. Right? With the tilted fitted. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then there's, let me think, there's the fedora A track. Yeah. So the, fit, the fitted maybe was with like a throwback jersey or something. Yeah. yeah. Although I had I had my Sean John years also uh -huh. a little before that. And then, yeah, the fedora with the leather jacket. Fedora. But in between there, you were starting to like step up your, your fashion because you were like DJing yeah. for Kanye a little bit, right? Or no? Yeah. Did, did have any influence on your fashion? Nah, not not directly. No, that was I don't know. That was kind of more, um, I don't know, some sort of whatever I was getting into. And then as as you the got little, into electro, yeah, and production, and you started like going into fedora, like fedora a track, yeah, right? yeah, because you know, yeah, you're right. Like right before fedora <laughs> years, it's funny. Um, <laughs> I was like, I was like starting to spend more time in New York. My brother had already moved to New York because right. he was like. Um, going to Columbia there but like sort of starting Chromio at the same time so mm -hmm. I would come and visit and I, I would like I was sort of discovering like that downtown scene and like shop at like Union or whatever and get like the right, all over right. tees and <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it was yeah. like the you know all over hoodie graphic tee era yeah. uh -huh. I mean that was when we yeah. were like wearing American apparel, American apparel hoodies right that was like the shit, like Dior jeans. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah those Dior jeans yeah, with, yeah, like uh -huh. a, yeah, with a yeah. V-neck and shit. Yeah. And then the V-neck started getting like deeper and deeper. Yeah, deeper. Yeah. Like, yep. fuck <laughs> your belly button right. at that point. <laughs> yeah. But this was like fedora, like denim jacket, I don't know, denim jacket or and then it evolved to like leather jacket. Yeah, leather track. jacket. Yeah. yeah. And I, then, also a few leather vests. Leather vests. And then recently. Oh, yeah, yeah, leather vests. Yeah, leather vests. Mm -hmm. And then recently it's been. Blonde A track, blonde, right? right. A -track. Yeah. Blonde A track, yeah. 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 So it's yeah. Come, appreciate come the, the timeline here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. But never have yeah. you seen any shorts. Come full circle. Yeah, exactly. If you think about it, nowhere in there, nowhere is shorts, shorts incorporated. We're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm a hairy guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, so I got to be honest. It's it's like looking back at your career. Yeah. And I was kind of like talking to people and I was like actually talking to like people in the crowd. We went to the bar to get a couple of drinks and mm -hmm. stuff and every, you know, everyone's like looking forward to you. Oh, cool. And then we're, we're just like wondering like which A track are we going to get? 
Oh, for the set today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. today. And I was and I was kind of thinking. I'm like, shit. Like I recently DJed somewhere, mm-hmm. and you know, like uh, they know me for hip hop. You know, mm-hmm. I do everything. You know, I play everything, reggaeton, and like you know, ah. EDM and everything and all this shit. But I remember this one girl was kind of like upset with me because I was mixing it up so much. Uh-huh. And she was just like, what's the deal? Like, I came here for my birthday. I expected uh-huh. you to do this and you did some other right. completely different shit. And I was just like, you know, my bad. Like, there's not a lot of new hip hop out. And I right. just didn't want to do the same fucking hip hop set. I, mm-hmm. was, you know, I was I wanted to play all this other music and I was like, yo, my fault. But mm-hmm. I was thinking like, damn, it's like, to get that expectation of which A track are we gonna get today? Do you know? People will ask me before a set, like, "Oh, do you know what you're gonna play?" Yeah. And you know, I'm sh- I'm sure you guys also freestyle a lot. Like, I don't I don't plan my sets. I might like for certain shows, I might you know make a playlist of like a few things that I feel like playing, and then I'll dip between that and other stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but although that question comes up sometimes before a set, yeah. Like literally today, this one guy came to talk to me before the set and was like, are you going to play Bloghouse? And I was like, I don't think this crowd knows that stuff. No. <laughs> but, um, but so, yeah, even though that question will sometimes come up before a set, luckily, for whatever reason, I really haven't had to deal with like discontent people after the set. Like it doesn't really happen that someone will be like, damn, I thought you were going to play, you know, this or that. Like, and I, I always play a couple different like many different styles within a set mm-hmm. but yeah i can't really think of of a show where someone would have said like oh the, I, I came to see this and you did that instead yeah yeah but there's also so many dynamics it's not only the selection right yeah for sure because we're, we're all kind of wondering is he gonna do like any scratching or routines or anything yeah like that i was, yeah. I was waiting know. for the robot rock uh beat juggle <laughs> that never happened today yeah <laughs> um yeah I, I mean but even with cuts like a long time ago, it sort of, it became kind of like a bit of a mission to me to like figure out how to integrate scratches in a set in a way that's a little more subtle and that's not like this big like, hey, watch me do a solo thing, but more just part of the technique that I mm-hmm. mix with, you know, because I, I started with turntablism and battles of course. and then I learned how to mix. So then, you know, there was a long period of like, how do I marry those two you became this child prodigy yeah it was funny so like I, so <laughs> it's funny <laughs> now, now i get it it, it get took it. me years to get it like for the longest time you know all the way back to when that stuff was going on when i was winning the dmc and those the, yeah. those battles you know there would be like this enthusiasm like whoa like that's so crazy Da-da-da, how do you feel and i would just be like what are you talking about? Like, I'm just scratching. Like, I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't, it didn't seem that out of the ordinary to me at the time. And, and even like when I started winning battles, there was a little bit of backlash. Like some of the DJs that had been trying to win for years. They and, hated you. Yeah, they were sort of like. There was, there was hate. Yeah, there was hate. So I had to build thick skin early. And I think it helped. Like really early on, I had to learn how to deal with people being like, well, he just won because he's like a cute little kid. And I'd be like, in my head, I'd be like, I'm, a much better scratcher than this. Like, I was just like, <laughs> what are they talking about? But also... Here, I thought Canadians were nice. <laughs> yeah. No, but, no, you have to be cocky to battle. But, um... Yeah, but, you have to be, like, actually, like, You have talking, to be cocky to be an artist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but battle, battle, battle DJs is different. Battle's different, yeah. yeah. Battle DJs is like, they they will not give an inch you, at all. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and, and there's know. a way to still, to, like, to have a little bit of cockiness and still you know be nice or like not yeah. be a prick i mean like, you're you're probably the most humble battle dj don't you think they're they're pretty know. fucking yeah i mean i don't know i don't anyways, know actually, but, you know um we had a, shortcut we just had shortcut oh uh, he's yeah he's, he's so humble yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you but, might be but for two. years i was doing those battles and and you know whatever came with it and you know there'd be like magazines that wanted to you know run a story about me or this and that and i would like literally i would look at it and be like what's everybody's so excited about? Like, I, what's so special? Isn't there, like, there's a, like, or I would just sort of be like, well, this other DJ is much better than me, or, or like, I'm still trying to get better. And, um, n- like, just the last couple of years, I can now watch the my set from, like, the DMC yeah. and be like, that's pretty fucking funny. Like, I'd just be like, now I get why, why people were like, hey, come see this, this is nuts. It It took a while for me to, like, see myself from the outside and be like, 
okay, I guess this is kind of out of the ordinary. Yeah, because in your head, you're just doing a competition. Yeah. And it's almost And like, I was practicing hard, and I was just like, I, I'm going to do my best. And then it, I won. I'm it's, like, the, I won. it's the equivalent of like, I don't know, if you were in Little League and you had like a Little League championship. Yeah. Well, not even that. Yeah. Maybe that. You I, know? Yeah. I was going to ask you, did that come from one of your Fool's Gold um, competitions? What was it? Duke the Gold. DJ? Uh, oh, Brandon Duke? Brandon yeah. Duke. He yeah. was super young, too. He was like yeah, We had a couple of really young DJs. Yeah, yeah so did that... Like, because you had them just killing it where you went back and you're like, oh shit, maybe it was something at that point. I mean, me. like, even by then, like just at some point in the last like 10 years or so, I, I've been able to watch the videos of the early shit for me and be mm -hmm. like, okay, I get, I get that this was like some sort of attraction. Because, <laughs> and you know, I, would, I started getting booked at, you know, all kinds of events. Like I was in the underground hip hop scene myself, mm -hmm. you know, living in Montreal, but like, absorbing you know idolizing new york and just wanting to you know be part of that that wave of indie hip-hop like the backpacker years like just you know buying every fucking company flow or raucous record and like, oh that was just God. like yeah. the, the 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 ethos for me mm -hmm. and um um but i would also get booked at at raves because every rave had like a turntablist room you know, they'd be like, oh. the jungle room's here and the happy hardcore room's there <laughs> and like the weird techno room's here. And we got like uh, A-Track and Craze and Q-Bird and Razel or whatever in this room over here. So I was like hanging out in raves at like 15, 16, like half the time showing up with my mom and shit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, and, and then like also playing at these like, just like weird like music curiosity exhibition sort of settings like i played at the montreal jazz festival which is really prestigious in like 98 and 99 i think wait um, so when you did that as a kid yeah were you like putting together like a jazz set or no like well i was also like playing i was also like so i did that twice the first time that i was invited at the jazz festival it's kind of a trip it was with it was to scratch with a band and that band was bill aswell who played bass on Rocket by Herbie Hancock. He's like this yeah, yeah. famous ba bass player. John Zorn, who's like literally like an experimental noise horn player, uh, like like free jazz kind of shit. And I forget the name of the drummer. And they had like literally a, a noise band. It was like jazz musicians doing experimental noise music. Mm -hmm. And I think they hit Qbert or someone like, hey, can you recommend a scratch DJ in Montreal because we're playing the Jazz Fest? And, and Q was like, well, you got to get A-Track. He's right there. So I played with this band, you know, doing really avant-garde shit, you know, at 16. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just like, but as far as I was concerned, I was showing up with like, you know, bionic booger breaks and whatever scratch records that we were using at those years and just <laughs> being like, you want me to scratch to this? Okay. And just like literally like show up and scratch, yeah. you know? <laughs> and the following year that I played at the jazz festival, um, Carl Craig was doing his inner zone orchestra project, which was like Carl Craig with a fucking orchestra. <laughs> and the, and someone, I don't know who asked both myself and kid koala who also lived in Montreal kid koala, yeah, yeah. To, to open up. And then I just did one of my like, whatever, like routines, like, the same kind of routine that I would do at table turns or at a, you know, whatever battles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was just showing up in all these various spaces, just doing me and people and people around it were like, Oh, this is so interesting. And like sort of choking their, you know, uh, stroking their, their chin. And again, like, I think at the time I was sort of like, whatever guys, like just show them, the, when do I scratch? What? At, at 9.30? Okay, <laughs> just show up and scratch. <laughs> like, tell me when to go. <laughs> I remember, um, so like, I came up with Boogie Blind. So oh, like, dope. Yeah, he's from West Harlem, and I was, yeah. staying, I was staying in East Harlem at the time. And I would go to his crib. I love And, uh, yeah. you know, I think this is around Vestax, the competition okay. time. Yep. And then we would, I would literally be hanging out with him because I was like rapping at the time. And nice. DJ. Let's talk about that. <laughs> and, uh, he, almost, he almost got signed to the Rough Riders, bro. Yeah, no. Oh, okay. He was the original <laughs> gym, right? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so then we would be, I'd like, be hanging out with him and then we'd be sitting on his couch and he'd be like, you know, kind of practicing. Yeah. And then we'd literally have either, I don't know if it was VHS or your DVD of you winning the DMC. Okay, yeah. It would just be on repeat. Oh, wow. Yeah, we'd just be watching. VHS. Yeah, we would. We were just watching it over and over and over again. Wow. And I would just watch and I just, I'm a little older than you. So okay, I would yeah. look and I'd be like, 
I got to do something with my life. <laughs> this is fucking kid. <laughs> this is fucking kid over here. Well, that's and you were so good, and you were like, you know, Thanks. at the time, I remember being like, yo, this is, this is like, because you know the DMC battles can get ridiculous. Yes. It's like, there's like motherfuckers like with like, I don't know, rubber bands. Yeah, for sure. They're like, they're yeah, they're yeah, doing, yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen these battles. They're like ridiculous. There's yeah, guys no, yeah. like Just, playing the record like a violin. Like they're doing all these kinds. Of, and they're always from like weird countries. Yeah, like, yeah You yeah. know, in somewhere in Europe. But yeah. like you just came in, you were raw, you were cur- like you had scratches with curses, <laughs> and it was like the most well-rounded um, uh, routine. Oh, thanks. Well, you, you know what I mean, right? Because yeah, some people delve in scratching yes. too much, and you were but like, you're out of animation too. Like you would be like, are you fucking out of your mind? I was like, Damn. <laughs> yeah. But, but but what you're saying about being well-rounded, I th- I attribute that to coming from Montreal, where I had like a vantage point to like. You know, in those years, I'm sure you remember, there was sort of like regional styles. So I was looking at the executioners in New York mm. and they had the best beat jungles. Right. And then I was looking at the scratch pickles and they had the craziest scratches. And then I was looking at the beat junkies and they, like someone like Mello, Mello Babu, um, they really influenced that well-roundedness that, that you're describing. Like I was sort of like, I want to do sets like them. Where so like, even when you were young, you, you were like... Looking to just kind of touch on yeah, all areas. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wanted to have a little bit of, of everything. It was also a time period where turntablism was like evolving so fast. Like every year there was like some new trick being invented. Right. Yeah, right. So I was, I was so young that I was able to pick it all up the same way that like kids learn languages probably. Because mm-hmm. like the DJs that were more established had to relearn how to scratch for something like the flare or whatever. They were like, what do you mean I got to do this with the fader, that's the opposite of the transformer scratch. Like for was for me, it was all just new information. I was taking it in. So I was able to like pick it all up really fast. And yeah, like I was saying, like watch this or that DJ from from New York, this or that DJ from um Cali, just you know, watching those same tapes that you watched yeah, yeah. and put together a set. Yeah, it's I was like kind of looking at some old videos and shit and I yeah. was watching and you know, if I was a father, you know, or or a parent looking mm-hmm. at my kid. I would be thinking, what what is it in his head that's making him so good? That's making him <laughs> excel. No, no, like what is it? What is the superpower? Is it the you know the the focus? Is it the, yeah. the drive? Is it you know what is it in the kid that's triggering this like kind of greatness? And then because I've been, that's interesting. I've been talking to like a uh, a therapist, right? Yeah. Because we all have like superpowers, like yeah. Like with me, I'm super analytical, uh-huh. so like I can see what's wrong in everything okay. from like a design to like music or yeah. anything. Yeah. But then like you got to know when to turn off that superpower for your own personal life, even for yourself, sure. right? Yeah, I have that. Or then you start yeah. like destroying yourself, yeah, and you're destroying yeah. everything, yeah. right? And even the people around you, destroying like people like, you know, this is a, you know, you're breaking <laughs> down people. Yeah. So you got to like turn it off. But I was yeah. like wondering, 25 years looking back, yeah, as a kid, what do you think it is that was like kind of your superpower that allowed you to be this um, child prodigy? Well, I'll tell you what it's not. I don't think, I'm not a huge believer in like, like a natural gift. Like I worked really hard (laughs) to get to that skill level. So I think certain people have like, uh, there's some sort of like affinity, like there's some sort of like, like certain people can pick up on something more naturally than others. So I'm not saying that there's no gift at all, Mm -hmm. but I think there's like, the gift is like the entry point. Cause all I know is when I first tried to scratch, way before I got a turntable, when I was on my dad's belt drive turntable, the same way that everyone- Like all of us. Yes, right? And even people who aren't DJs, because we're all DJs here, but like in a certain generation, certain age group, everybody tried to scratch a record if you were like into (laughs) hip hop in the 90s. For most people, it sounded like ass. For whatever reason, when I tried it, it sounded kind of okay right from the start. So there's something, there's like a fragment of a natural ability there, but that's just to get you in the door, I think. Or like for me to get me curious and be like, I think I can do this. Mm -hmm. Then it's a whole lot of determination and diligence and concentration, focus, whatever you want to call it. Like really just, you know, there's a point where every day I would come home from school and rather than go hang out with friends, I would see my friends at school, but when class was over, I would just go straight home and practice. And, And my practice time, 
I'm very methodical also, so I would like really organize my practice time. I'd be like, okay, for the first hour, I'm gonna, tr I'm gonna practice this pattern, and then I'm gonna spend another hour trying to master it on a faster beat, and then I'm gonna you know, wow. freestyle my scratches and see if I can get a good like, variety of scratches in there. You know, like, I would really break, th break down my time like that. So I think there's something about the, that, that very determined approach right. that probably led, because like, within two years, I was world champion, like from between starting and, and, and getting there. So <laughs> something crazy. happened. <laughs> yeah. But like that's crazy. I, you was like 12, 13 years old yeah. with, this, with this mindset. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that you're breaking everything down. Yeah. And and you know, the the other piece of the puzzle is I'm very close to my brother, um, and he was already a musician. Right. So mm -hmm. he wasn't a DJ, but he was going out to clubs, because in Montreal you can go out when you're pretty young, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was 13. That's like 18 or 16, yeah. right? It, yeah, 18, 16 18. is legal to drink though, right? Something? Um, I forget. No, 18, I think. 18, 18. I think 18. 18. Yeah. Um, so, but my brother was, anybody that's met him knows he's pretty tall. When he was 17, he was already quite tall. So when he was 17, he can get into clubs. <laughs> so I'm 13, Dave's 17, playing guitar in bands, but also just starting to go out. So seeing actual DJs. So I just happened to like pick up this like, you know, little obsession or knack mm -hmm. for scratching. But meanwhile, he's like going out and actually wit witnessing actual DJs. So also kind of knowing what a DJ is supposed to sound like. Right. Mm -hmm. So then he would come home from school also and see me practice and be like, that part right there, that's not, it's not supposed to sound like that. He couldn't tell me what to change, but he'd be like, I don't know, I've, you know, just from having seen DJs in club settings, he'd be like, that's not right. It's interesting. So I'd be like, ah, shit. And I would sort of like get back to it, you know, practice something differently. And a few days later, I'd be like, what about now? Yeah, that's good, you know, or, You know, if I was like coming up with routines, he would just give me feedback as a musician, like almost like a producer, yeah. so, you know, where he would be like, this part's really good. Do it, like extend it. And like, what if you sped the record up? It'll be even more impressive. And again, he couldn't tell me how, but he would just sort of like coach and produce it mm -hmm. and then leave me with it. And then I would just practice for hours, hours, days and days and days. And like that definitely helped, you know, having someone that, um, you know, that, wanted me to win yeah, and that yeah. could give me such useful feedback and that had just enough of a distance to not get caught up in the super technical details but just be like that doesn't sound right this sounds good right you know so that definitely nudged me in some good directions um but yeah and, and you know there's probably like fortunate timing like like we were saying like i fell into it at a point in time where turntablism was like exploding You know, and I was able to be like the, the young face of it. I, I have a question because I, I think when you started winning, yeah. when you won, first of all, yeah. I feel like it changed a little bit, the scene a little bit. It obviously, yeah. obviously blew it up, mm -hmm. but it also kind of like, do you think you also kind of like destroyed it a little bit? <laughs> Ooh, interesting. You, you know what I mean? Like, just because it was kind of like, oh shit, like, what can we top? After I, this prodigy, like, mm. you know, for like a regular, like a, a I don't know, like a 20 year old or like, I don't yeah. know how Man, old these I'll DJs tell, no, are. Honestly, <laughs> where it's kind of like, what, what what's the fucking point? There's no, a fucking I'll, 15 year old prodigy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? No, honestly, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not like, I'm not saying this to, uh, to toot my own horn yeah, or anything, yeah. but like one of the things that people have told me the most over the years, and I still continue to hear this to this day, which is crazy, is is like a whole slew of DJs who said, when I saw that video of you, yeah. that made me wanna believe be that I could do it. Like right. that made me want to be a DJ. Because if you saw, you know, Hubert and Mixmaster Mike or Rock Raider, mm -hmm. they looked like superheroes. They didn't look like, no one was watching Mike and thinking that could be me. You'd be like, yo, that's fucking Jimi Hendrix. Like he's like mixed with like a space alien. Like right. how does that even exist? And I, I, I guess from what people have told me over time, they would watch me and be around my age group and be like that kid looks like me <laughs> like i could probably do this so it became more feasible i think like, so like there's the a youth, lot of, to the youth right? yeah there's there's definitely been a lot of djs who told me that they got into it from a sort of familiarity when they saw me but as far as like what you're saying of like oh well what else can we do honestly that there's shit that craze did you know in the years that right, followed right, that right. was mm -hmm. that probably made everything more impossible than I did. And, or if anything, like he and I, you know, we, we formed the allies, like we joined a crew together mm -hmm. and we sort of set out to like dominate and like 
there was a few years of that before shit dried up because the 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 battle scene did dry up why do you think it dried up I think every scene has a... You think it's the music, it changed, right? It was yeah, like more club-based and like everyone was going out? <laughs> well, I think it's... I think any any musical scene that like hits some sort of stride... Right. It, that lasts four years usually. You know, like I don't... Like if... Whether it's... You can look at SoundCloud rap or you can look at like... You know, what was going on with the Strokes in those bands in the early 2000s. Oh, or you man, can look at grunge right, yeah. or whatever. All that shit, it really just lasts about four years. You know, maybe f- three to five years, and I, I, I think, think with turntablism, you know, there there was um, there was a point by two thousand or so where audiences just kind of like were less interested. In fact, the people wanted to see the Strokes, <laughs> um, and and I think the innovation itself kind of slowed down. Do you think? Do you think also like the fact that in the two thousands, like we were talking about this a little bit right earlier before. We were talking about that DJ stopped producing hip hop. So there was less mm. scratches in songs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then like the DJ aspect of it started getting pulled away from hip hop. Well, it, it started being different point. worlds for sure. Right. Yeah, like once once the early 2000s hit and like the biggest records were Neptunes and Timberland. Because it was Rock all Wilder. about the Triton, the yeah, Triton and Swiss. keyboard. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right that it was like different textures. It wasn't the language of vinyl anymore. Yeah, because it, it was, was like, synthetic. Exactly. Yeah. It wasn't like right. sampled. It was a sample. It was like, they stopped using samples. Yeah, and then but, all, the, yeah, all of these like different producers didn't have like a DJ back Background, right, like, right right it's true i mean it's i guess you know swiss i guess was a dj before yeah and he, no he, he wasn't he well that's what no, he, he was no he, he wasn't, wasn't. He okay i'm not I mean, gonna he, i'm not gonna no, litigate no. <laughs> i'm not gonna litigate he was. No, i've heard he I've was heard into stories. clubs in new york let's no, put it like that i heard yeah <laughs> no but i heard stories of him doing shows for dmx uh-huh. and someone had to was like bending down on the table like actually spinning okay i don't know I don't he was standing there okay he was standing behind the guy i've never seen a video nor a picture so no no I'm not gonna believe that. But, no, no, like, but what I was gonna say is what was interesting to me, paradoxically, is like once it got to like Neptune, Neptune's and Timberland era, yeah, I had so much fun making routines with those records, yeah, mm-hmm. and like I think my the best routines that I came up with were in those years, like the Missy Get Your Freak On routine mm-hmm. that I had, mm-hmm. or clips grinding and like the shit that I did with those records. I I look at it now and I think that that was even more futuristic than what I did in my DMC years. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. for sure. You know, it's it's funny you bring up Craze. Was he kind of like a big brother to you? Like, yeah. And guys, I was looking at like patterns yeah. in your years. Yeah. And through almost every stage, you know, in your early competition years. And then when you were like, you know, a full on turntablist, mm-hmm. you had Craze. Yeah. And Q Bird before that. And you know, yeah. Because like Q, Q brought me into the Scratch Pickles, but as an honorary member, because I was much younger than the rest of the mm-hmm. crew. And then when I met Craze, he had just started the Allies, and that, and so I, I went there because we we were all like at the same right same level of our career. And then as you're doing production, I yeah. mean, I mean, you went on tour with Kanye, yeah. And then you know you linked up with uh, Armin Van Halen, yeah. And it was like throughout a certain period, you had like you know big like bros a big bro throughout every stage, yeah. And know? an actual big bro too, yeah, 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 and yeah. a big yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was I was kind of wondering. You know, throughout those stages, like obviously they, 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 you know, they guided you, they helped you. It was like a collaboration of yeah. sorts and and everything. But as you started getting older to where you are now, do you feel like, like you know, kind of doing it, everything on your own? Does it feel different? Like, did you feel something at a certain point where you were like, "Well, I got to do this all all this shit on my own." I, I felt it independent. I still collaborate a lot. You do. I still collaborate a lot, and if anything, also, you know. Sort of ever since I started Fool's Gold, there's a point where I started feeling the responsibility to like help out the next generation too. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. like there's definitely a point like, look, when I, when I got into turntablism, I was, I met a bunch of my heroes and I was lucky to like build friendships with like- and they were super cool with you. Yeah. And supportive. Yes. Which, yeah. you know, they didn't have to. And, I, and that probably, you know, I'm sure that doesn't happen to everyone. But in my case, from Rock Raider, rest in peace to, to you know, Hubert and Mike- Babu and the Junkies, you know, but also Peanut Butter Wolf, when he still lived in San Francisco, like mm-hmm. early Stone's Throw years, um, you know, Super Duck Breaks, Rasco, the unassisted era of Stone's Throw. Yeah, yeah. You know, I met Wolf then, and Cut Chemist, Money Mark, 
like all these characters who really, really, really took me in and, and showed me a bunch of shit, like really gave me jewels. Even Jack. even early on, like in Montreal, uh, in uh, Quebec, right? Yeah, you, you had like DJ Devious, right? Who yeah, was just wow. like this unknown DJ. He's just a local DJ. You were like what, fourteen, and just going over to his crib? Yeah, like, that's right. Yeah. How old do you think he was at that time? We were ten years apart. He's he, uh, this guy Devious that you brought up was yeah. was a uh, uh, local DJ, um, who you know just hip hop DJ uh, who you know sort of built a friendship with me. We had the same birthday. We're exactly ten years apart. <laughs> I think I, we definitely have the same birthday. So I was like thirteen or fourteen, you know, and this guy was in his early to mid twenties living in kind of a rough neighborhood and he would come pick me up at my parents' house in his car and just bring me over to his crib and yeah. just show me records, like play me Run DMC and, and Public Enemy and, and Rakim. And that was like a big part of my hip hop Like education. how many hours were you guys spending? Like, like, you know, a good two, three hours. Cause when I heard about it, I'm yeah. like thinking when I'm 24, would I hang exactly. out? Would well, I go out of my way? That's my way, point. Right? That's my point. Like, and would, also, you and, don't and, say, would you yeah, do that never? That's my not. point. No, but that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. amazing. And Kid Koala did that too. And Kid Koala had just signed to Ninja Tune. Like he's like mm. putting out albums on the same label as Cold Cut and Amon Tobin and shit. He's amazing. He's amazing. And yeah. he was also a, like a student at McGill University and like DJing with a local band, like doing all this shit. And he would just like invite me over to, yeah. you know, his little college apartment where he had like a bunch of roommates, but like a vinyl everywhere and be like, oh, you know, this is a, you know, this is a digital 16 track recorder. This is how I record my tracks and, mm -hmm. you know, um, just kind of show me his craftsmanship. But exactly like you're saying, here's a bunch of characters who were like probably 23 to 25 when I'm 13, 14. Yeah. And they're inviting me to their house and they're giving me their time. It sounds creepy, but it's just no, it really, it's, 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 it's very it's, beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah, it yeah. is. It is. It, I'm I'm moved to this day. Like Rock Raider had, you know, young kids, right? And like he met me um, when I won the DMCs, and he was like, "Yo, whenever you come to New York, give me a call. Come by the house." Yeah. yeah. Next time I go to New York, I call him, and he's like, "Okay, cool. Take the subway to." whatever stop oh he, I, was, he was in Harlem yeah, yeah. I take that I take, <laughs> so Rock Raider lived in Boogie Bond in the same yeah, building yes yeah. Yeah. so you yeah. were right there I, I got yeah. to know Blind through Raider yeah yeah so oh. you know so I would go to Raider's house and yeah he's like he was probably like tw yeah I was 15 so he was probably 25 with like two or three young kids and a wife and he's making time for me like right. I would go to his house and spend like four hours and like we'd show each other our routines and this guy by the way is my hero mm -hmm. like I was watching his DMC tapes when I was training for my battles mm -hmm. and so when, when I became 25 like when I reached that age I remember explicitly thinking hey hold on a second am I making time for the kids on the come up because there's, yeah. there's a bunch of people who changed my life. I think that's so important because when I talk to DJs now, yeah. no one ever talks about helping other DJs yeah, or like younger DJs. Yeah. You know and what that, I mean? Like That changed my life, man. Yeah, there, and it, there's, like, there's like a dozen artists at least who like played a huge role in me because you know how scratching was in those years. Like, And I, I started only with the most technical aspect of turntablism, right. where everything was in a rationale of like a six minute DMC routine. And everything was so technical, you were you know doing these routines for an audience that knew all the, like who had done what before, so you didn't have to like really walk your audience into it. Like mm -hmm. they already understood all this technical shit. So when I started spending time with a Money Mark or with a Peanut Butter Wolf or with some of these guys who had a broader like, almost sort of like DJ Shadow-esque approach to, you know, working with vinyl, that broadened the way that I was thinking about what I was doing, yeah, yeah. you know? And, and I'm glad that they caught me early because I could have just stayed, you know, the hyper-technical, you know, locked in the bedroom ner mm -hmm. nerd. I stayed a nerd, but I started being aware of like who I'm performing for. So at 25, what, what was like, what activated in your mind to be like, how can I help some of these younger DJs? Did anything, you know, did you, uh, did you just have the thought and just kept, <laughs> kept going? Dude, did you, you know what's thing? funny? At 25, yeah. that's when I started Fool's Gold with mm. Nick. At tw I, was, I was, yeah, at, at 25, that was 2007. Cash Dubs and I and Dust La Rock, rest in peace, and my brother, the four of us started Fool's Gold that year. Yeah. 
And, and Fool's Gold is when I started championing other artists and giving people my time and like literally picking anybody's call at any point, any hour of the day, like, you yeah, know, because artists need someone to talk to. Yo, I'm not, do you think I should really put that record out? I don't know if people are going to like it, da, da, da. then you have to like have that conversation. Well, this is like Kid Sister, mm-hmm. uh, the Cool Kids, right? Cool Kids, Cuddy. Uh, Kid Cuddy. Cuddy. Yeah. Yeah. Danny Brown. Danny Brown. Danny Brown. Danny Brown a couple of years later, but mm-hmm. in the early years, Treasure Fingers, Sammy Bananas. Yeah. Even later, like Floss Adamas. Yeah. I mean, Floss right. right at the start, because, you know, Josh from, from Floss, he, he left the group later on, but Josh from Floss is Kid Sister's brother. Mm. I didn't know? know that. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Wait, how did you link up with Kid Sister? Um, it's MySpace. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That. Like basically 06. Because y'all were like dating, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, uh, we dated for like three years or something around that time. Yeah. And I'm still super close to, to Josh. I mean, and um, like his, I'm, I'm his son's godson. Like that's from friendships that date back to those years where I was going out with his sister at the time. But, um, and you know, now he makes music under, under the name Yemi too. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, th- we pretty much all just met through MySpace and mutual friendships. Cause like I moved to New York in the summer of 06, which was like that whole time period was really pivotal for me. Like that was like a new, pretty much a new career for me, like a whole new life. What like, were you doing in New York? Um, I remember like, is that when you started doing the rub in Brooklyn? Sometimes? Yeah, I would play the rub and I would play Roxy's parties. I would go play Sway. Oh yeah, Roxy like, Cocktails. Was, yeah, 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 shout out to Roxy Cocktails. Oh, wow. She was like, I would love to have her on the podcast. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. I, can, I, can, I can text her tomorrow. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, basically, that was also, I was in the middle of like my stint of working with Kanye. I worked with Ye for four years. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you sort of like rewind a little bit, I battled from 97 to 2000. In 2001, I'm sort of like, I'm done with battling. I want to do different shit. But I spent a few years like trying to figure out where to take it. And this whole scene was changing. So I was getting booked as like world champion A track or whatever, but I wasn't really part of a scene per right. se. And I, yeah, and everything was changing. Because it's weird. Like you came to this child prodigy and yeah. then it's like, you know, you got all these bookings and like years later, yeah. you're just kind of like, oh, wait, there's like. Well, then you have to do. Next, there's a, right? Yeah, exactly. There's a point where you have to do something with it or you yeah. have to like, you know, tack on like a musical identity that goes beyond scratching yeah it's almost like where's like i don't know like where's your like where, where's your voice yeah kind of 100 right? yeah, yeah so in 04 i start working with yay that gives me like a whole new level of visibility next thing you know people are seeing me like on the vmas and like mm-hmm. you know hip-hop honors vh1 that kind of stuff and like all these you know just big stages um so that jump started a whole thing for me like a new a, a new chapter but like a new wave of of visibility but also by like 05 06 i'm starting to think about like making music for the first time you know aside from like is that because you were witnessing kanye like with production i, th- I was wondering not, this. not really no? it was more i think it was just my own growth there's a point where i just wanted to like make shit I used to always watch my brother make beats like right, right. way before Chromio. My brother was like producing like hip hop records for mostly Montreal groups. Although one beat on the nonfiction album, the future is now an album that has production by premier large professor, Pete rock and my bro. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And I scratch. It's a song called the cult leader. <laughs> oh shit. Um, so, so he was just making beats on an S nine fifty, but like, you have like the best big brother relationship. Oh yeah. That's my yeah, guy. Man. That's it's my like guy. The po- it's like, <laughs> like the poster child for like Big Brother. Oh, yeah, he's, yeah, like, yeah. he's literally no, but even like anyone, any one of my friends that met him, he was sort of a big figure to them, mm. Big Brother figure to them too. Like wow. he just looked out for like our whole crew. So I used to watch him make beats. So I kind of knew like just the basics of like how to truncate a sample, or whatever. Like just things like that that you have to learn at some point. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, by the mid two thousands, I was like just curious to like make some make music myself or like make little edits but then you know 2005 or 6 you're starting to get like there's a new thing going on in the DJ scene where like Holotronics 
is happening. Right. Diplo's bringing in Baile Funk. People are starting to learn about Baltimore Club. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's just like it's a like culture a, of edits and like mixing a lot of different shit together that's happening. It's kind of mm-hmm. like the development of mashup of the yeah. mashup era. Yeah. Well, the mashup era was yeah. yeah, it was like the mashup era, but it was evolving. It was getting, You're right. It was getting more edgy. Yeah, because like a little bit. Yeah, because the you know that that um, because I remember New York was obsessed with mixing down south shit with like the most obscure yeah like mo- the most hood down south shit like let's put it on like you know. Tina Marie or like some weird yeah. shit. Let's well, like I made a whole mixtape like that called yeah, Dirty, Dirty South, South Dance. Dance. Yeah. yeah. So with with the production, I was listening to it again. Oh, cool. Yeah. It actually it aged well. Oh, like thanks. it sounds good. Thanks. You know what I mean? But even like the but that, that's how I learned how to produce was making right. these little bootlegs where I'd, first I would grab like some sort of electronic record and like cut up little samples on top of it mm-hmm. and, and blend an acapella. I, I actually went into my iTunes. Okay. And I looked and I said, "What's the earliest yeah. track remix that I have?" And? and I was looking at it, <laughs> and I was it? listening to it, and I was like, you know, this is this is like it sounds early. It sounds. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what it is. Yeah, it sounds a little rough, but you know, like it sounds a little rough. Uh, Boys Noise O. Oh, I mean, I'm yeah, yeah. It's I'm, like I'm, early stages a little bit. That or, was 2008. 2008. Um, yeah, I. I I'm. I still kind of like it, but yeah, it's, it's it's rough. No, I thought <laughs> you were gonna bad, play. My bad, no, no, no. I thought you were gonna play like like uh, a few years before that. I was making weird B more like oh yeah, uh, B more version of Cassie, me, and you or something. Right, like, right, right, you right, know? right. But yeah, no. The the, uh, the boys noise is a little a little rough around the edges. Yeah, but yeah. Like, no, but, no. I have like I have like beeper, right? Okay. Yeah. 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 And then, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't like that remix. <laughs> um, no, I don't but, have. But yeah. look. Basically, um, I was like, I used remixes as a way to learn how to produce. Yeah. yeah. And I was very aware. Which is everybody, right? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Especially with DJs. You're like tinkering it. You're like, oh. And it gives you a starting point. Right, right. It gives you a starting point. And like, I was like, I was pretty hard on myself in the sense that like, the name A-Track as a DJ, the bar was set somewhere. Like, you know, it was like world champion, whatever. So if I was going to make tracks, you know. I felt like the tracks had to be good because mm-hmm. I couldn't play myself with with the it's so much pressure, right? Yeah, and because I didn't it, I didn't know how to produce, mm-hmm. so I was just kind of messing around and and um, and doing little remixes, and I got into production and and you know my DJing itself. This was like early years of Serato. I was the first Serato Endor C ever. Like I was the oh, first. I was, was going to ask you that. I saw in the um, interview that you was the first DJ Serato. Or you was the first DJ to um, endorse Serato. Yeah. That's Except great. like there, there was like people in New Zealand because they're from New Zealand. So like the first DJ outside of New Zealand. Yeah. But like AM saw me use, use it. Jazzy Jeff saw me use it. I was the first DJ using Serato. Um, and, but having Serato gave me access to like a whole bunch of, you know, just playing digital files. Suddenly I was like, oh shit, all this music that I didn't have on vinyl. Let me mess around with all this yeah. stuff. That's, so, a, that's literally the time where every DJ was like, oh shit, I could fix all of these songs, create new intros. Yeah. And like do all of this shit. It's and all these yeah. mashups. Remember, like, like I would send you guys like different MP3s. That I know, I, yeah. Like useless songs that I ex- I made yeah. extended <laughs> intros. But and and so I came to New York. Um, I was half the time I was on the tour with Con- on tour with Kanye, but the other half the time I was like really inspired by like a new approach to DJing, you know, after 10 years of like only playing hip hop, I was like, oh shit, I can play, you know, mix up like some weird dance hall records with like this new Outkast song and then this like Be More joint, da da da, and all this stuff is 130, wow. And, um, and I'm like, I start making my own edits to play with those tracks too. And yeah, I met Roxy Cottontail, shout out to her. And I was like, I love your parties. Can I play one of them? And and she literally told me, she always tells this story. She's like, I just saw you at Madison Square Garden last week playing with Kanye and Usher. She's like, I don't think I can afford you. And I told her like, play me, pay me whatever you want. I don't care. Like, I'm not trying to like literally pay me whatever you play your other DJ, your other DJs. And I think, you know, she wow. probably paid me like 300 bucks or something. And I was like, cool, sure. Next week I'm there. And I started popping up at at the parties she was doing, whether it's, it's um, Sway, but either other stuff. Um, and yeah, made, you know, built a friendship with with uh, Ayers and Cosmo and Eleven, showing yeah, up yeah. at the rub a little bit, and sort of just like discovering the scene and like, but you know, infiltrating a bit of a new scene, which was in a sense like sort of 
almost leaving behind some of my old scratch friends who weren't really seeing what was going on there musically. Right. But I was kind of like, I need to make this move and like everybody can get back together in a sec, but like, let me go and explore here. And, um, I mean, with you dabbling into some of these parties, like the rub yeah, and, yeah. and Roxy's and Roxy's party. Yeah. Did you get an itch to do, want to do like kind of a club scene, like to do the regular club scene or you had no interest? Um, I was I was kind of wondering, you know, like if you know we bring back like that old conversation, that Twitter kind of battle between you and Rockticon. It was it like wasn't a, it wasn't a battle, but okay. yeah, yeah, it was a, <laughs> an exchange. <laughs> it was a, a debate. Okay, yeah, yeah. a debate. Rockticon's argument was like, how could you know what the plight of the working DJ is? Yeah, and it made me think, like your path, you know, you've. It, it's like you you had you went to greatness so early on. Yeah, and you had to like kind of like always stay up there and be influential. You went from Kanye and then, you know, uh, Duck Sauce and all yeah. of these things. And it's like, you never got a chance to just like do a like, hundred, s- like start a week. Pers- yeah, just like DJ a hundred person group. Right. Yeah, and then, no, and, and that's so I realized you know, that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to have, to have, you know, had a quick start to a level of notoriety where the majority of my shows were well attended, sure. Yeah. But it doesn't mean it was easy because if anything, well, I don't, I don't even, I don't even mean the attendance of it. Yeah, I mean just being like kind of a nobody, right? Without the pressure, yeah, and just kind of going in and learning how to just read a room and like, and just DJ for a hundred people. And be no, like, yeah, I had to read a, I had to learn how to read a room in front of bigger crowds where like bigger. I really couldn't <laughs> fuck up because they were coming to see me as a track, and, right. and but they didn't realize that I was literally learning how to DJ because all I knew was beat juggles and scratches. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it was it was a different um a different it was a learning course. curve. Yeah, different yeah, curve, right? Yeah, different curve and and Balls. um and even <laughs> wow. <laughs> <It's> creative. <laughs> and and there was many learning curves cuz like once I got into electronic music and house music, which was right around those years that we're talking about, um I had to learn how to mix house which is much different than mixing hip-hop right you know where you're like you first of all you're playing songs that the crowd probably doesn't know which is the opposite of playing hip-hop where you want people to recognize what you're playing Mm -hmm. and you know this whole sort of seamless thing and and you know keeping tracks mixed together for like you know a minute or longer like that's it's it's a completely different style of mixing and and you know even just like linking up with someone like dj medi you know rest in peace to him as well mm-hmm. but you know he was in france with the ed banger guys and but when he met when we met we were kindred spirits in the sense that like he also got his start as a teenager in hip-hop because when Medi was like 16 he was producing mc solar and all these great french rappers you know this sort of like young prodigy of beat making um, and, he, and, and he really earned his stripes in France as a hip hop DJ and then got into electro and house. Yeah. So when we met and I was like producing Kid Sister, but then he was like playing me Ed Banger stuff and they had Uffy and like sort of similar artists. Right, right. We we're like, yo, we're kind of doing the same shit. But he was already playing house for a couple of years, whereas I was just getting into it. And we started doing shows together and like I learned a lot from just observing him in terms of like the difference in mixing, yeah. you know, house and techno and all that that was like a whole new thing to learn throughout your career have you ever like worried about money ever uh not, not to say it like that but do you know what i mean where you were like, stressed like fuck how am i gonna pay rent you ever had a <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean you ever had you the know, job i've never had a job other than djing i started right. djing when i was 13 or like professionally when i was 15 um is there a point where you're like man i gotta I, do this you know? I, I never no honestly like, fuck the pandemic no, I'll, I'll, honestly <laughs> I, I never got you know to a point of like you know rock bottom kind of like oh shit i'm not sure i don't know how i'm gonna pay rent or that sort of thing no I, I never got to that point um but i will say that like to maintain that like especially over not even 25 years but even 10 plus years like um it took a lot of very active um strategizing and sort of like you know career reinventions to try to catch shit before it would get to a point of you know hitting a really low point where i would have stressed Wait, about talk it. about that more like sure because that's a big thing in my because career. you can sense when you need to make a change yeah, for sure. Ex- exactly when turntablism was kind of drying up a little bit like for you sure. said and then you started i think you were telling a story um 
uh, I think it was what on Complex, right? Okay, yeah. And you were you were talking about how you became Kanye's DJ, mm -hmm. and like uh, you know your determination, like to like link up with the rock. I think you guys were doing like a a release for John Legend, and you were trying to get Kanye's attention. Yeah, and, I had to like, and you did this routine. Find him in London. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Find oh, him. Yeah. You did this routine with Get By. Yeah. And then, you know, and I think someone, Rockefeller, like, linked you guys up at a press yeah, conference. Yeah, Dame. Dame. Yeah, or Dame, oh, Dame. Just, Dame and his assistant. Oh, okay. Uh, his assistant. Uh, oh, wait, how were you, and I was curious, how would, how did you link with Rockefeller at that time? Well, that's, that's what happened is I was in London for a normal gig. Uh -huh. Like, someone in, someone in London was still booking me as DMC champion A-Track mm -hmm. in 2004, just to come and play a hip-hop set or whatever. And, um... Just by coincidence, uh, the like a, a whole bunch of Rockefeller artists were also in town. So to promote my show, the promoter of my show is like, "Hey, are you down to do an in store at this record shop? It's called Deal Real. They do these cool in stores. You know, we need to sell more tickets." Like, by the way, yeah, I think my show wasn't selling well. So he's like, "Let's do an in store. We need to like get more people buying tickets for tonight." Cool. As it turns out, that record shop had other performances that day including Samantha Ronson, who at the time was signed to Rockefeller right, as right. a singer-songwriter <laughs> right, with a guitar. Right, right, right. I remember that. Right? And by the way, a young lady sovereign who was completely unknown also performed that oh, day. Wow. So they've got like a couple people performing at this shop. This is just like a cool shop that's well curated. So they're like, oh, we got A-Track. He's going to scratch. And then Samantha Ronson with Rockefeller with her guitar mm -hmm. and this new rapper who happens to be Lady Sovereign. So I'm doing my routine and Dame is there with Samantha, just kind of like that's his artist at the time. So Damon Dash sees me do like my beat juggles and shit. And he knows hip hop, of course. So yeah. he's watching me and he's like, who's this kid? This guy's, this guy's good. And um, Samantha knew of me. We hadn't met yet. Uh, but like, you know, I knew Mark a little bit. And, and, you know, she, and I think that's the first time I even heard of AM. I remember her being like, do you know my friend AM? And I hadn't heard of him yet. But, you know, we're all talking and Dame is like, yo, you guys, like, let's all do some shit together. Like, let's keep in touch. Like, he wanted me to DJ for Samantha, really. <laughs> and because I remember her being like, like talking to him the way that like a teenager talks to their like their dad that annoys them. Like, yeah, yeah. Dame, 8-Track's not going to be my DJ. The 8-Track is perfectly fine by himself, <laughs> you know? And, and Dame's assistant is like, let's exchange numbers. Like, you know, let's, do, let's figure out something to do together. Um, I go play my gig that night. And at that point in time, I was traveling with a loop pedal. And I would do these routines where I would like use a loop pedal to like recreate samples and songs. And, you know, so I had this thing with, with Get By where I would grab the Nina Simone record that Sample, the piano yeah, was yeah. sampled from, mm -hmm. use my little loop pedal to loop it up, and then like scratch a little beat, loop that on top, and then grab the acapella of the Quali joint and play it over like my rendition uh, of Get By through my loop pedal. The guys from the record shop are at my show and, and they're like, yo, that, like at the end of my set, they're like, yo, that the get by shit you did was dope. You, you should have done that at the store. And I was like, oh, that's like a whole other piece of equipment I got to set up. And they're like, well, you should come back tomorrow because we have John Legend, who at the time was like barely known. Mm -hmm. But if you're a Kanye super fan in 2004, you know, post the blueprint or whatever, you probably know that there's this R&B guy that Kanye's producing that's yeah, called yeah. John Legend. So they're like, John Legend's coming to the shop. Apparently Kanye's in town. Like he might even show up. So like, why don't you come back tomorrow and do the thing that you did tonight? So I go back on, on the second day and it's a John Legend in store, but they give me like 10, 15 minutes to do my thing. And Kanye's there, hoodie over his face, kind of like right, right, you know, right. incognito in the corner. And he sees me do this thing with his beat basically. And his face lights up. I can see him while I'm doing my routine. And, and he's like tripping out. But then I didn't get to talk to him. Like they left right away. So then I had to like track him down. So I'm like hitting Damon Dash's assistant like later on. Like, but, yo. So you knew like inside. I, I, could, ha I, I have to make this happen. Yeah, I could tell something happened. And like there's periods in my career where I can tell that there's like a next thing that I have to find. And I, I don't know what that thing is yet. So I'm just like, I got my antennas out. So like around those years, 2003, 2004, I had stopped battling for a few years already. So like my gigs were starting to feel kind of random. Yeah. And like 
you know, I had this. You're just spotting the red flags a little bit. Yeah, I was right? just sort of like, eh, I should probably look for like something to do. And like, I really wanted to DJ for Missy. Like, I was like, try, like trying to figure out like how can I meet Missy Elliott or like the Neptunes. I do all these routines with their records. Um, so I, you know, there was a general thought of like maybe I could DJ for someone, but it has to be an artist that'll like let me shine. I'm not trying to just be like Mr. Playback guy. Right, right. You know. Um, and then this thing that I just described happens in London. And I'm like, I got to track this guy down. Like, I saw his face when I did my routine. Like, I need to at least have a conversation with him. And so, you know, th with the help of Dame's assistant, who's the only number I have in that crew, she's like, well, you know, we have this press conference tomorrow. And like, I literally was on my way to the airport and like showed up with my suitcases at this press conference trying to like catch Ye's attention. Like, yo, we should talk. Um, and, and that's how I got the gig. So yeah, there was, and you know, as far as like these little reinventions or like looking for the next thing, you know, it went from like DMC guy to like the Kanye shit to then producing my own music and remixes. And some of that stuff, some of those remixes, you know, starting to do well, right. starting Fool's Gold and then becoming, I don't know what to call it, an impresario maybe? Like just like people started seeing me as like, oh, you know, a tracks involved with these these you know musicians that are like kind of changing the sound there's kid cuddy there's kid sister there's the cool kids there's this there's that and like the style of djing is changing and people would you know diplo had mad decent i had fool's gold like there's a few of us that were like pushing a new sound especially for north america mm -hmm. and you know festival culture wasn't even really in america yet but i knew that from i knew festivals from playing overseas so like i was trying to help bring in you know a thing but you know even after that like when edm actually happened mm -hmm. and like the vegas you know dj residencies became right. huge and and lucrative and it became and you know djs had top 40 records you had like the swedes and calvin and 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 you know skrillex and and those kinds of artists like making top 40 songs and being on the cover of rolling stone and all that like i had to, that was like another big change that i had to navigate where i was like how am I gonna, how am I gonna like navigate this world? What do I want my identity to be in this world where I kind of find a lot of the music cheesy, but there's some stuff I like. And I've, you know, there's almost a sense of like, I tried to bring this DJ explosion to America for years and now it's here. So now what do I do? Cause there's also, now there's starting to be young DJs that are like getting top billing at festivals. Right. Next thing you know, you got like, you know, Porter Robinson and, and Maddion and, and um, uh, Martin Garrix and these DJs who, they're the 17 year olds who are like getting top billing the way that I was when I was doing the DMC shit. Uh -huh. So like, what's my place gonna be, you know? And then even after that, like post 2015, everybody starts talking about like, well, the DJ bubble, bu uh, bubble kind of burst and like Vegas doesn't want DJs anymore and da da da, like then it was, you know, getting back into hip hop stuff. Mm -hmm. And so every couple of years, there's like positioning stuff that I have to like figure out. I kind of think like to, to have a long career, there's, there's kind of two ways to do it. Like either you stick to one thing that you do, that you're one of the best at, yeah. and like you just keep doing that thing. And maybe people don't come knocking for a couple of years, but eventually they come back and, and, you know, you've done that one thing, kind of like The Alchemist. Mm -hmm. Not to say that people didn't come knocking, but he definitely had a renaissance, right? right. Like The Alchemist was like paying his dues, you know, on Mob Deep, uh, uh, you know, murder music era. Right, right. Yeah. And, you know, just producing like dilated people's type records. And, and then he stayed that guy for a long ass time. And at some point in the last 10 years, he became like the godfather of like the Earl generation. And like, because he stayed that guy for so long, now he's the king, the legend. For whatever reason, I took a bit of a different approach where like, I was more like, music is changing every couple of years. Let me sort of like dabble in shit as, as it moves. I think because once I started Fool's Gold, I liked to champion the new shit. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was more a question of like, I'm never going to take like a full... 180 like i'm never gonna like completely turn my back on yeah, yeah. what i've built so far it's more a question of, like how do i like how do i elegantly 
bring the baggage of what I've of what I've done so far into new right, you know, right. new sounds and new settings every couple of years and like how do I refresh it because I mean from the outside it might look like everything's hunky dory but like every couple of years like the you know festivals will tell my agents like we've booked a track five times already like why do like why do we need to book them again right, so like right. it's up to me to keep it interesting you know it's up to me to come up with new projects and be like you know what you know, book the Brothers Maklovich or, or let's do a Duck Sauce comeback. Let's do this, let's do that. Like, let's do me and Cameron. Like, just, you know, that's like, that's me actively thinking of ways to, to refresh the formula and to give people something new. Or like during the pandemic, like, let me learn how to use an SP-1200. Let me build a drum machine performance. Let me do these like, you know, Roland TR-8S drum machine right. synced with Serato, you know, hybrid sets. <laughs> I, I push myself to to, to, to experiment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's 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 weird. Like when when you started, like when Duck Sauce emerged, mm -hmm. there was a lot of like DJs. When the duck hatched. Yeah, when the duck hatched. <laughs> Where like there was a lot of DJs. Like obviously, you know, DJs are haters, right? So like there were a lot Somewhere. of talk. Yeah, that you like abandoned hip hop, and in order to kind of like be accepted by the EDM world. You needed like Armin Van Helden's like cosign, and he kind of needed that talk didn't get to me, but no, I'm listening. <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, telling yeah. you what, yeah, like, no, this what is was I, behind the scenes. Sure. You know what I'm yeah, saying? I, yeah, and in, in 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 return, like Armin was getting kind of like a fresh face, like probably he was yeah. getting like the youth. So he they was, were just kind of like he was reinventing himself, reinventing himself for sure. Yeah. So there was this like it seemed like a good marriage, oh, yeah. of it. But uh -huh. at the time, it was like oh, this is like a tracks like desperate attempt to like get into the EDM world and, and, and all that shit. But you know, I don't know if people were saying that they weren't, they weren't paying attention because I was making electronic tracks for, no, no. for like, years. I remember one of my favorite joints was that, the Waka Flocka. Oh, okay. Well, let's do it. Like, <laughs> and oh, that one's really good. Oh, yeah. shit, yeah. I forgot, and, then, I remember, that, yeah. and then the Money to Blow was, yeah, was yeah, dope. Yeah. And then obviously your biggest one, the Yeah, Yeah, Yeah's. Um, uh, yeah, that yeah, one's which is, which is still big. Which which is like, you can play yeah, every yeah, night. It's not going to hit. It's insane. Yeah. No, but, but I like uh, Barbara Streisand. That was my favorite from that Duck Sauce era because nice. that shit was very different. It just sounded like all disco in eighties. But when the one track. but when the first one dropped, anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. I remember being like, "Holy shit, this is like something we could play," because you know we were all playing classics, right? Yeah. But it kind of yeah. tied everything together where we're like, "Oh shit, we can go a whole new direction," mm -hmm. tying the classics and this and like hip hop and all of this yeah. stuff. But that was that was a that was intentional anyway yeah. was meant to be a refresher yeah you know because even in the scene that i was kind of hanging out in that was like electro like everybody was trying to copy justice like who can out distort their distortion right you know who's got the distortionist <laughs> bloody beat roots yeah. bangers and i linked up with armand we had already like we became friends a couple years before that and like anybody that knows armand that's met him knows that like he just kind of like makes music when he feels like it. Like he's not a big hustler. He just kind of like, he's Zen. Mm -hmm. And so we like built this friendship for a couple of years. And then one day it was like, all right, let's make a song. It and just happened organically yeah, like that? Yeah. Wow. And you're right that he and I had this symbiotic thing where we sort of helped each other out. Cause right. Armand is someone who had a big influence on me also in the sense that like house DJs from his, his generation we're starting to be bitter and we're looking at that a sort bit, of way explain that bitter. Cause, cause if you think about like what we now call blog house, mm -hmm. right. That's that, that very sort of jarring electro distorted sound. It's of like 2007. A, it's almost so. like a punk rock version of house. Music, sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. The, the classic house heads were looking at that and we're sort of like, that's not house music. House music is a feeling. Right. House music is da da da. And they're not wrong, but like people wanted that new shit. And Armand was, he is the opposite of bitter. And he's always been someone, for as long as I've known him, who is interested in like the new shit, you know? And that's probably why he stays youthful and just like always stays relevant. Well, he was a fan of your, uh, your Dirty South. Yeah, shit, right? yeah. Like when, when we met, we were sort of like, oh, we're both of us are hip hop kids who are like messing around with house and electro, right? But like, we also think that shit is corny, so we're not hang we're like we don't dress like house DJs, but we just make it because it's fun to play, or we see it as like the modern version of disco or whatever. So we decide to to make music, 
And he kind of turns to me like, what do you want to make? And I'm like at his crib with a bajillion records all around us. And I was sort of like, let's do this co-house. Like, let's sort of bring back that French touch, you know, that sort of... Um, which is kind of his... Yeah, his, which, yeah, which for is, sure. I mean, he made... Amazing you, at, right? <laughs> yeah, he made Flowers and You Don't Know Me, like some right, of the best right, records. Classic, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he's sort of like, oh, you want to make, make that? And he hadn't thought of making those kinds of records in so long. He was like, oh, it's time to bring that back? It's like, easy. And he just starts pulling out samples. And we, when we made Anyway, we kind of knew... As much as we didn't know that Barbara was going to be a hit a year later, I'm not saying we knew Anyway would be a hit, but we knew that it would feel refreshing in a climate where everything was like right. grinding electro. We were sort of like, here's a classic. But the yeah, there was, there was a need for like an organic sound, right? A, yeah, like I think that, so. Like and that, so that, that was the intention with that record and, and with that Duck Sauce was born. Um, and where did that name come from again? I mean, I mean I'm sure you've said that story like millions literally of Literally just goofing around. Yeah. Yeah, because it seems like everything you guys do is a goof. Yeah, a little yeah, bit. Like Barbara's yeah, Barbara Streisand was a goof, right? It's the ultimate goof. Yeah. I can't believe we record. got away with it. It's a fun record. Even like you had this that music video for what was it, Mesmerize? Yeah. Or, with, yeah. Yeah. With where it was just like going inside Inside buttholes. Buttholes. Yeah. And, and it was like this video? this like <laughs> Uh, you know, Inception. Uh, yeah, well, I was like, when I was thinking about this whole thing, I'm like, what is this relationship that A Track has with Armand that, like, this is the shit that they come up with? Well, all you know? we do is goof around, and somehow there's music that comes out of it's it. It's like an element of trolling in it a little bit. Yeah, but it's but trolling kind of impl implies that you're you're like making fun of your audience. Yeah. I think, whereas we don't. We're just like it's like two kids going a fucking dude. Like we're a Beavis sleepover. and Butthead. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah, they just yeah. yeah we're shit. step brothers. We're Beavis and Butthead. We're uh, I don't know what. Yeah, that like that's the mindset that we Wayne's get into. World, everything. Wayne's World, a hundred percent. It's Wayne's World, but like, imagine if Wayne's World wanted to be the house version of the Beat Nuts, like just finding the best loops. That's what Duck Sauce is, and like when we made our album Quack, we really tried to get it in the comedy <laughs> category. Yeah, yeah, we wanted it to be classified as comedy. Like we're like, please, please, but like those partner labels were like, oh, it's not going to chart. That we're like, fuck, but it's a comedy album. When, when when you were trying to get into like kind of the dance scene a little bit, yeah, before Armand, or yeah. you like you were thinking like all oh, the yeah, festivals yeah. are coming, yeah. Um, were you getting like pushback from the, like some of the house promoters and the and the house DJs? Like kind of like, you know, you're a hip hop dude. Stay out of this shit a little bit. Um, occasionally, but then I would just because, find somewhere else to go. Like because if, like when when I was talking about all the hater DJs, yeah, we were thinking like doors were closing on them. Yeah. Like they were they weren't allowing you through the gates. That you needed someone to like help you through, which was Armand. Like, no, part, you know, I mean, I, and, and I think. When our when Armand and I started Duck Sauce, it was just as beneficial for both of us. Mm -hmm. But I was getting bookings in that world before I met him, and I I had no idea how the house and electro scene would welcome me, if at all. Right. And I was always pleasantly surprised that like a lot of the DJs in that world knew my battle shit, and they were like they were just psyched that I was interested in what they were doing. So I would kind of think about what you're saying, like, oh man, but they might think that, you know, I'm a newcomer, Johnny come, late, come lately in this world. But like, you know, for instance, I remember the first time that I reached out to Laidback Luke, mm -hmm. you know, kind of tracked down his email address. Who's like a great DJ who can yeah. scratch. Yeah, yeah. And also, yeah. you know, he was making like Dutch sort of big room at mm -hmm. the time. So it feels very distant from like my little scene of hanging out at Union in New York and like, you know, making mashups right, right. and, and, you know, swapping <laughs> files with Diplo. So I'm like, yeah, Luke feels like he's on another planet. And we had signed uh, this record, Cross the Dance Floor by Treasure Fingers. Oh, great song. Which is a dope song. Yeah, great yeah thanks. Song. It's, yeah. You know, to this day, one of our best releases. And I wanted someone to remix it. And I was like, I wonder if Laidback Luke would be down. He probably doesn't even know who I am, but fuck it. Let me try to reach out. Find his email address, reach out to him. And, you know, I remember, I'll always remember his reply being like, yo, I used to watch your DMC tapes. Wow, you like my music? What the hell? Sure, I'll do a remix for you. And, you know, and he liked the Treasure Finger song and he was down. So, like, a lot of the response I got was like that. Same as when I met, you know, the Ed Banger guys or Boys Noise or Soul Wax or whoever in Europe. They're all like, Scratch DJ H. You like our shit? Yo, let's do some shit. Yeah, yeah. So, it was just cool that they all kind of, like, welcomed it. 
I like how you said that uh, they might not know who he was. Not for sure, I was man. Like, Fuck, I might not know <laughs> sure. who you are. <laughs> nah, but I never assumed. I know Kanye West is DJ. Yeah, like DMC <laughs> Still, Chad, I don't know. know. <laughs> it, in those years, especially, like it was really separate scenes. It was. It was separate scenes. Like like the world. The same way that like. I only got to know Funkmaster Flex later on, right? Mm -hmm. Like radio DJs were in one world, mixtape DJs, Clue and them right, were in another right, world. Yeah. I was somehow this weird anomaly that went from scratch DJ to like the house electro mashup, you know, the innovator or whatever, experimenter. Right. But still like the, the, the house guys in Europe were on another planet. Tiesto was not another world. Like every, everything was just separate. Well, everyone was like hating because it was like, also when you were in New York, you bring would, up you bring up hating a lot. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> DJs hate a lot. I don't. Yeah, I guess. But I guess you don't experience. Not those house, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. He don't, no, pay, he don't no, pay attention no to it. <laughs> no one's texting him the group chats like, yeah, they're talking shit about you on this chat or this chat. No, Yo, he's, I, he's in this like great world of great big brothers yeah. and like you know like supportive uh, like <laughs> colleagues and everything. Nah, but I think not. Nah, you know, maybe. But I think there's a point where you can control like what what. What well, like, you, I don't want to say like what energy you keep around you, but there, yeah. there is no amount of I, that. I think you're right. But I mean, at the time, even like, so like when you were infiltrated, like you were going into New York. Yeah. There were DJs like, oh my God, like A-Track is a turntable list. He's trying to do clubs. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. Sure. Like he's horrible. Maybe. Like, you know? Maybe I was. <laughs> no, but that's, you know, but that's, they're always going to But if I was, something. then I, I, it, I had to learn. But it's, no, but it, it's kind of them like, like stay in turntable list. Right. Why are you coming into our world? And it's like, well, even, it, even even if you weren't horrible, you are hor you were horrible because it was like like unless I doing, absolutely demolished it, they would just say it was horrible. Like even, I had to really yeah, but even it. then they would be like, you know, what I is just, he doing? He's like doing different shit. I like, just love the fact that he doesn't. He's not afraid of failing or whatever the fuck he wants to get into. What's the reason? Yeah. yeah, yeah, like yeah, he doesn't know. care, and then people yeah. can talk shit about him all they want. I don't really get like, scared of shit. It. Yeah, I'm, I, but all the way, like. I don't know why I entered a DMC Because he was battle. fucking 15. He, yeah. he, he no, was exactly. dealing with this when he was 15, right? <laughs> There's an element of that for right. sure. But even then, like, I don't know why I entered a DMC battle at 15. You're not supposed to. But there was something in me that was like, I can fuck it. Fuck it. Yeah, <laughs> fuck it. <laughs> was this something So maybe was? there's something wrong so, with me. No, no, it's like being disruptive though, right? A I little guess, bit. Yeah, like yeah, I, yeah. you have to be yeah. a little disruptive. Yeah, yeah. There's like you and Armand is a little disruptive. For sure, right? for sure. We, we Armand and I um, definitely... Uh, like among the things that we have in common like we used to always say that that Duck Sauce was a punk group also it was like it's comedy and it's punk it's not house like house is the last thing because house is the most obvious thing that it is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and you know we followed up Barbara Streisand by Big Bad Wolf which is a absurd record yeah, yeah. so <laughs> So um, we, we, crazy we tried, cover. Come, I remember crazy when we cover. tried running it and I got yelled at in the club. <laughs> yeah. They're like, what do you play? We like to fuck with people. We like to fuck with people. So I was like, I shit that, I'm not playing this record. No, again. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <Yeah. to> <laughs> the, the, the shit that we had in common was more than just being hip hop guys who made house music. It was also like an approach of like all these fucking stuck up people in the DJ world that have all these rules because house music is crazy like that right. too. In house music, it's also like, oh, well, you know, if you make tribal house, you can't sample a vocal from, I don't know, fucking mm -hmm. Jersey or like the, all these weird rules where you're Unwritten like, what rules. are you talking about? And our, and both Armand and I would look at all that shit and be like, you guys are all stupid and like, just make our own shit and, and, you know, just make it fun and make it work, you know? So there, there are all these rules um, between, you know, if you're a techno DJ, you can't, it's, it's almost like the fucking, the Torah, like, like weird religious, <laughs> you can't eat on the second Tuesday of the, <laughs> of the third month That's if hilarious. you're, you know, if you started playing drum and bass on the full moon, like who cares? Well, what do you think you, what's the like one thing, I actually want to ask this about Kanye as well. Okay. Well, what's the one thing you learned personally, professionally from Armand and Kanye, and how did it affect your approach or your perspective on on anything? Um, I was I was kind of curious. Yeah, it's like two great, you know, what I'm saying two great producers that you worked with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and they, and they also like super like you know they got their own style, they got their own vision. Yeah, they got their own you know approach to shit. So I was wondering what you gathered from that. From yeah, the both experiences. The Kanye shit is 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 interesting, and, and you know. I don't get into to present day Kanye, but but I will acknowledge <laughs> I will acknowledge the They're just talking those, about your early, Kanye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. When, when I was the, when the I was old working, Kanye, the old Kanye. Um, I I remember really 
absorbing the like how far his vision went for everything that he was working on. I remember watching him make a beat in the studio and being like, I'm going to put so-and-so on this song. This is what the video is going to look like. Ooh, the artwork will be like that. And this will be the song that will get me on this chart. And da -da -da. and just thinking of all this shit while he's still like cutting like, up the snare. Like forecasting it yeah. almost to a point. And know? like... Packaging it, getting it ready for market sales. And thinking yeah. of who's going to like it and, and what's, you know, like even just like being a Trojan horse, like this is the record that will get me these fans and da-da-da. And, and oh, and then I'll do a remix with so-and-so on it. Like just thinking that far ahead and, and having, challenging yourself to have that much vision um, made me yeah made, made me think about my projects that way too because at that point in time i was starting to make little you know concept mixtapes and mashups and edits and 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 you know it was the myspace years where visual branding was new for djs yeah so for me it was sort of like okay if someone comes on my myspace page what's the aesthetic that i want them to see that you know will be consistent with my tour flyers and like, mm -hmm. and this and that. And like, what, you know, what's the associations I want to have and, and you know, how am I going to position this or parlay this thing into that thing? So I think that, yeah, that, that, um, that, th th that vision for anything that you're working on, you know, thinking so many steps ahead is probably what rubbed off the most. And but it would also have affected all the packaging and everything you did from duck sauce to fool's shit, gold and all of that. Probably shit, although right? but but I I already had an affinity for that. Mm. I was already Cuz I love that logo. Yeah, the fool's that's, gold logo. That's the oh, fucking yeah, man. Yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. Bro. And every I remember Definitely. everyone wanted to use that artist. That's the rock, that's yeah. the piece. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, a lot. There's a lot of people who had a, played a big role in my life who passed away also. But mm -hmm. yeah, rest in peace to Dust. He cre he was the original Fool's Gold uh, partner, art direction for everything for the first five years of Fool's Gold. Of course, did the logo, did all the Duck Sauce logos too. Um, so my whole crew, me, my bro, like the four founders of Fool's Gold, because Cash Dubs is a, is a d designer too, mm -hmm. and. Dave and I are just have like an appreciation for it. So me, Dave, Cash Dubs, and Dust, the four founders of Fool's Gold, we all were into the importance of branding. So I wouldn't say that Kanye uh, necessarily like influenced, yeah, yeah. influenced that. But yeah. it's more just like thinking of everything while you're starting a project, you know? Because, you know, now, even if you look at the shit that I work on now, every project I work on, I, I, even just for myself, I make it very well defined. I know what a duck sauce record is. You know, if, I'm, if I have an idea for a track, is it going to be a duck sauce joint or a track collaborating with another house DJ or Brothers Maklovich or a hip hop collaboration, whether it's with Cameron or Young Thug or whoever I've worked with, like, mm -hmm. or, or with Yemi too or some of my other DJ friends. Like, I, all of these um, projects and collaborations that I do are well defined sonically and even with an aesthetic to where like if whatever idea I have, I put it in a little bucket in my head. Like, oh, this will be for Brothers Maklovich. Oh, this is something I should do with the magician. Mm. And then, you know, and, and then I start I start building yeah. it out. You know? And Armand Armand influenced me in a lot of ways because he's one of my best friends for over 15 years now. But um a couple things, man. Uh he has he has um he's like a human fucking compass like he has like this sense of like knowing where to land with something and like where to find shit that is so inspiring to like if he's also if he's working on a track and i'm or if we're working on a track together especially in the beginning and always be one i would always want to like add shit because i was like still learning how to produce like oh let me try this trick with a baseline and he would know when to stop mm -hmm. and when you're learning how to produce that's really tough to have that sense of like this song has everything it needs to have. So whether it's that or just like this way that he um, unabashedly just like follows these ideas and instincts of his without, without overthinking it, without being like, is this dumb? Should I not do this? Like just following that, that little child voice in your head. Yeah, yeah. He definitely like helped me lean into that more. So like you're saying Armand helped you with like not overproducing. Yeah. Not overproducing and, and like tapping into the ideas that kind of end up being the most original ones. I don't know how to make a hit. The, I, I don't even, What do you mean you don't know how to make a hit? I, I, I can't sit down and make a big record intentionally. 
Mm. The couple of records that I've had that I've had some success, Heads Will Roll and, and Barbara being the bigger ones, I didn't know I was making a big record. I, I, but I was like, I mean, Barbara Streisand, we were literally just trying to make ourselves laugh. So we're, you're <laughs> sort of like following this little voice in you that's like, that's like, you know, we keep laughing at this so someone else will find it funny or fun. This is at least worth trying. And, and Heads Will Roll also was like, I had no idea that it would get to the level that it was at, but there was like, it's an idea that came out of me pretty naturally, like without, it wasn't really overthought, like mm -hmm. just s turning those, their strings into stabs and playing that bass line, that kind of just like flowed out of me. And then, and then I just like fidgeted with it, like messed around with it for a long time to like find just the right structure for it but like it just kind of like came out and yeah. I wasn't like let me make a big remix at all mm -hmm. I was taking on remix after remix at that time because that's how I was learning how to produce right so that was just one remix out of many and um but that one in particular there was something that just kind of like came naturally with it and that ended up being the biggest record do, do you think in like in like production like I guess like you know everyone like the alchemist has a sound premiere yeah. has a sound yeah even with premier Ad scratching, lib. right? Yeah, Ad for lib. sure. So like, there's like a, it's almost like formulaic. It sounds formulaic after a while. Yeah. Because it's like, because it, after a while, you know how there's it a signature. Be, there's a signature. Yeah. Do you think you found that for yourself in production? I'm not, I could never, I could never really tell, but after a certain amount of time, some people would tell me that they've, they would hear, mm -hmm. you know, common threads in my music. Cause like, I never figured out a formula to produce. I don't have my one drum kit. I don't have my one mastering chain. It's just like a feeling? I Because every track I do is a bit of a different idea, mm -hmm. and then I just try to execute that idea. I'm not particularly good at producing, but I have ideas. I'm you a, so you treat it like a DMC set or routine, in a sense. I don't You're know. like, this will go here better. Let me move this here. Da -da 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 -da. No, it's no. more sort of like... Um. You know, I'm, it might, I might have an idea for a drum groove. I might, I might have an idea for a type of bass line or, or a way to cut up a vocal. Yeah. And then I just try to make that sound the way that it sounds in my head. Um, and it's so kinda, all, a lot of my tracks... It's kind of like it, it, it could start with a guitar. It could yeah. start with a drum. It could yeah. start with a sample. It could start with something simple. He's saying that the source could be so scattered. And, and, and even the styles yeah. of production I've done, you know, if you listen to the, my album with Cameron and... and yeah. You know, and and whatever house shit that I'm doing with like Farrakh Don or someone like that, it's it might seem like worlds apart, but I think there's some common threads. There's a lot of soulful samples. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I kind of my ears always drawn to like sounds that have like a certain character, maybe like a certain bounciness. There's like a lot of like rubbery bass lines or that mm -hmm. kind of shit. So like there are things that show up in a lot of my tracks, even though they genre wise might be different yeah um i was a little thrown off with the camera on <laughs> okay release yeah. yeah yeah i think we Definitely. like we saw it and we we're like this is this came out of nowhere yeah, yeah it took was, nine years to <laughs> it took was, nine years to make is I this right i, 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 I wasn't so surprised years, huh? yeah i wasn't so surprised I'm stubborn. because i you brought camera on to one of the fool's gold uh festivals i believe mm -hmm. in la or you, I in, forgot in what New York. It, no, but we, we put out the song Dipshits in 2014. Yeah, so I remember, he, I wasn't so surprised when that came out, because you always like had, I don't know, you always had this gift for hip hop in a way where you would put the festivals together, like mm -hmm. early ASAP Ferg would be on, and Fred sure. Montana and shit like I gave Ferg his first show ever. Yeah, 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 so I remember those things. I, when oh, no, I, we, we remember then, but if they dropped then, it, it would be like, oh, okay, this is aligned. Yeah. yeah. But then like in 2020, you know, to yeah. last yeah. year, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, whoa, this came out of like nowhere. Yes, because yeah. it took that long to yeah. come out. <laughs> Shout to camera on. <laughs> hip hop, <laughs> hip hop, hip hop. Wait, so what, what do you mean it took nine years? It was just just well, getting him to the studio, no, or, or like finalizing the no, beats. Just, what was no, it? it's it's just like if you look like from the very first time that he and I connected through Dame, actually. Mm -hmm. So, because you know, I met Dame back when I met Kanye. I would never, by the way, I would never know that you you and Ka and Cam would be like. Yeah, you would connect and be. But cool. that's that's what's fun, right? Like that's what that's why I do yeah. it. But how do you guys connect? I'm curious because I'm from I'm you know I'm from uptown and yeah. stuff. So yeah, I, like we you know we talk about Cam all the time. Yeah, he's the king. And I'm kind of wondering how you like what is it that you guys like connected with? 
Um, in in the beginning, it was mostly Dame having a vision and mm-hmm. Cam trusting Dame. Yeah, the way that it happened is I wanted to get a verse from Cam, and I do I knew Dame over the years, and Dame was you know he had his like art gallery in downtown New York, and he yeah. was keeping up with what was going on with culture. So he knew about Fool's Gold Day Off. In fact, he saw that I was putting Arab music on festival stages. Mm-hmm. And that Duke the God was managing Arab, so he saw that like there's people from his fold right. that were entering festivals. He knew that Cam didn't n- had never performed at something like a festival. He was still playing like hip hop clubs, you know, like doing like you know VIP walkthrough gigs in Connecticut or whatever, or like maybe playing a Rock the Bells kind of thing, but like mm-hmm. not doing what we were doing. So when I hit Dame to get a verse from Cam. Dame's a visionary, and he literally was like, you guys should do a project, and you should get Cam to play those shows that you've been doing. And we were supposed to do that. That was like at the end of 2013, and he connected Cam and I. He was like, all right, we're all meeting up, you know. Wow, this was in 2013. Yeah. yeah. During like, that was like, kind of like, EDM was was really hitting. Yes, right. And and But I, you know, I still had the itch to do some hip-hop shit on wow. the side. So... He connected Cam and I. I played Cam a couple beats and like, just because there was two or three beats that he liked enough and he trusted Dame and Dame was like, trust me, you got to work with this guy. Cam didn't know anything about me. It was just Dame saying, trust me. (laughs) And as long as there's a beat that's like kind of, that he could vibe to, that he could write to, he was like, okay. Mm -hmm. So we were supposed to do a project in 2014 and we recorded a couple songs. So when you were making, you had these beats already? Yeah. Yeah. I had a couple. Oh, were had, you like I gotta make some heat makers? It was, it was both. Shit. It was both. I, I had I had some beats. I had a couple beats just kind of laying around. So I picked the few that felt, you know, dipset ish. And then once we decided to work together, I looked for more shit. Or I would also like hit up friends for like, you know, starting points of beats, and then I would like reproduce them after. Um, and we started doing some sessions, and um, we made a couple songs. And then there was like one joint that we put on SoundCloud, and people liked it. And then we made that song Dipshits that was bigger and like we got Jewels on it and Cam and Jewels hadn't done shit in years. Right. I got Just Blaze to help finish the beat. Just Blaze and Cam had like 10 years of like not fucking with each other and like I kind of got them to <laughs> do, you know, to reunite on that. So it wait, felt wait, like- how did, how did you do that? You just hit up Just? Yeah, I went to Just studio. Oh shit. So wait, you're like, I Just was song. My, yeah, Just was my friend and um, yeah, I literally like- he was starting to DJ some Fool's Gold parties too. Yeah. And he was having a lot of fun because he was like reconnecting with DJing, right. which he grew up doing. So I would be like, yo, come play this party. Yeah, he's, so he's fucking nasty. He's His nasty, nasty. for nasty. sure, yeah. for sure. Trusting. So he was like, you know, he and I were building a trusty, a trusting kind of rapport. And I remember telling him like, yo, I don't know what you and Cam are like now, but I have a joint with him. and like, Because he was, he was tight because uh, he, he left rock and just found the heat makers, which was kind of like doing similar beats to to just just mm-hmm. plays a little bit. I right? think there was even a there. They probably had their own reasons too, but for whatever reason, they stopped talking for a while. Mm. Okay, okay. And I went to Just, and I was like, "Can I at least play you this song? Like, I don't want to get into in the middle of whatever you whatever you guys have going on, but like, can I just play it to you? And if you want, I like, I feel like you will appreciate it." If, but you'll know how to finish this. Right, like right, I needed right, the toms. Right. Like I needed the drama. The doo, 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 doo. Right. And I went to see him when he had a studio uptown, and like that's how it. Like what I hoped is what happened. I played him the joint, and he's literally like he kind of like sighed. He's like, <sighs> "All right, load up the session." Because he heard it and he was like, "Of course, of course, he knows how to finish this joint," you know, and. We um we ended up shooting a video for Dipshits. We announce a project. Complex puts us on the cover. Complex magazine is like, we're A Track and Cameron are working together. Whoa, let's give that the cover. They have a project that's about to about to come out. Mm-hmm. And then, what happened is what ended up happening periodically for years and years. It's like first you know, Cam disappears a little bit. Then I go on tour. Then we're, da, 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 then you know then two years pass, and then we sort of like link up again, make a few new songs. And then one of us gets busy. A lot of times Cam would sort of like, (laughs) he doesn't really, like he's been rapping for so long. Like at this point he was sort of like just making this shit for fun 
Um, but like he didn't like he has multiple businesses. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I hope you guys are watching his sports show now. It's so him. good. Yeah. It's the break. Isn't mm-hmm. it so good? It's so good. I never thought Mace and Cam would be like oh, the best man, sports so guys. I know. I who would have thought that? <laughs> but already at that point, and like look, I, I was starting to realize that I was in a position where I could get access to certain people that are hard to get. Mm-hmm. You know? Like same as when I was like making records with with Young Thug and Lex Luger and them, like mm-hmm. For whatever reason, I was able to like earn the trust of some of these dudes, and they were down to do shit and not charge me, and just they just liked what I was doing, wow. and and I was able to get a few people in the room, just like, and that's a side of production that I learned around then, which is literally just building trust, and um, there's not like a specific science to it, but just like realizing like, damn, I can get to some of these dudes that are kind of rare and pretty amazing and iconic. So let me do something with them, you know? And the cam shit, like once we had a, you know, a couple records down, I was like, this is pretty fucking good. So I just wanted to finish it. But like every, every time we were almost done, something would happen. So it was, called, it was almost like the release was like, and this is like- It was I've pretty been, much done in 2019 and we signed it to Empire. And then he was like, we had a release date and he was like, wait, 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 hold on. I have to put out Purple Haze 2. And then he puts out Purple Haze 2, and he's like, wait, 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 I have to go on tour. Then we'll release our shit. And then the pandemic hit. Mm. And then you lose another two, three years. Wow. Mm. And that's how you get to nine years. <laughs> <laughs> it actually would have been a good uh, follow up to Purple Haze 2. Yeah. Sure, like. but I'm, I'm happy. Like, I'm just. I'm so just when you released out. it, it was just kind of like, let's just get it out yeah. there in the world at yeah, this yeah, point. Yeah. Literally, like, I remember during the pandemic um, when Jay Electronica finally put his album out. Oh, yeah. I remember yeah. literally thinking, if this shit could come out, our shit could come out. <laughs> this is the shit that everyone said would never come out. <laughs> where, where, where are you at right now with music? I know you just dropped an album with your brother. Yeah, and, and, Rick and it sounds Wilson. great. Thanks. It sounds like, you know, it sounds almost like Anderson Pack sure, with, yeah. with like a little disco, a little rap mm-hmm. and everything like mm-hmm. that. It sounds great. That, that just happened organically. Yeah, that's um, you know the, the the artist, the vocalist on that album is a guy called Rick Wilson mm-hmm. from Chicago, and we sort of met him during the pandemic. You find yeah. a lot of talent from Chicago, huh? Yeah, I've worked with a lot of people from Chicago. Well, where 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 do you get that time? Where I don't, I don't, you know. don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It just happens. Yeah, because I've you know I I there was a song with Lupe I did a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. worked with GLC. There's yeah a bunch. Um, I don't know, but I just think it's also an interesting city. Yeah. But met this kid, Rick Wilson, and um, he had just done an EP with Terrace Martin. You know? Oh, shit. Really? It's dope. Yeah. I checked that out. Um, and so he was like rapping over funk beats and like, you know, my brother and I were both at my house during the, the early months of the pandemic and I'm kind of just playing him like, oh, look at this kid. And we're both like, should we produce a little EP for him? And then, you know, he came to, to L.A., and then, you know, EP turned into album, but it was kind of just as simple as like meeting the guy, being like, I like this guy and he stands for something. He's like for real an activist in Chicago, like organizer, politically very involved. So, you know, there was like, um, there was some depth to it beyond like, oh, here's some, someone who raps. He's also like someone who cares about things that I respect. So we decided to make a record. Wow. Just like organically like yeah. that, just listening. But also yeah. kind of being fans. Yeah. And um the pandemic kind of like put all of us in a place where we're like, what else can we do? Like <laughs> what's some shit that we could try out musically? Let's <laughs> let's produce a young artist. How did how did you handle the pandemic? Did you uh Because I, I know you were like streamed you were doing like a little I did a like, few streams. streams. Yeah. Not a ton. I wasn't like Mr. Like Mondays and Wednesdays or whatever. You were, it, you, I mean, with your mind, and you're, you were doing a lot. You were like drum machine. You were doing like yeah. all this experiment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, That's yeah. kind of how I approached it. I would experiment. So that side of the pandemic was very refreshing to me if that's okay right, right. just the sort of like oh shit i finally have time to experiment let me come up with like new types of routines with turntables and drum machines or like i want to make a you know like a backpack hip-hop set and i'll stream it then i'll do a french touch set i'll stream it let me do uh i did one set that was just like all songs that have cowbells i was just like what else can i do <laughs> like you know and then streaming that shit um so that aspect of it was probably needed and also like another element of the pandemic that i think i i 
I needed was just like to stop and like reevaluate some decisions. Like, do I need to accept so many shows? Do I need to keep doing things the way I've done them for so many years? What do I want to change when when shit opens up again? Like, just kind of questioning things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but it was also it was also weird to, to like I've never been home for that long. Like since I was a kid. Yeah, because you were mentioning like you know like your 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 agents or your agency would be like you know oh like we booked uh, a track five times already. Like, do we need, you know, like, right? Yeah, and then, yeah. like, every year you kind of want the bookings, right? You yeah. kind of want to look at your schedule and look at the bookings yeah. and everything like that. Yeah. And were, when the pandemic hit, did you feel like you were like detached from it and you, you weren't? Yeah. It was like a good time to not be as concerned about it. Right. Yeah. 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 To, to be sort of like, you know what? Who cares? It's fine. It's going to be fine. I'm going to keep making new shit. My brother and I started the Brothers Maklovich project. Mm-hmm. So we, we put out two singles and we started like streaming sets together too. So that was like, oh, here's something that we can tour when the world opens up again, which we, you know, we've been doing. Um, so yeah, it gave me a, a chance to, rather than, like you said, rather than just being like a little worried and like, oh, well, what else can I, can I do? It was more of a mindset of like, let me just create and then I'll find ways, I'll find homes for all these ideas. Yeah, yeah. But it was, yeah, it was also weird like on all kinds of levels just to, i mean you, know. you were staying active i remember i was seeing like a like a, a stream for the goldie awards right yeah yeah we did yeah. two goldie awards fun. online yeah you're gonna thanks. continue the goldie award uh, yeah i want to this it, i'm not sure if we'll end up doing one this year because we're celebrating the 15th anniversary of fool's gold this year with a bunch of events and just like wow. organizing all these shows through the year for the anniversary is taking up a lot of my bandwidth, which is usually where I would find time to put together mm-hmm. something like the Goldies. So we might have to just pick up on that at the top of next year, but I do want to keep it going. With, is it true that you've never made money off of uh, Fool's Gold? I've never paid myself a salary. You just, oh, you just keep it, just keep it, yeah. reinvesting it yeah, into the yeah, company. Yeah. yeah, or just, yeah, or like, we're a small company and like, uh, you know, whatever royalties come in like we got to pay our artists and and you know sometimes there's just like pay the staff, off. right pay yeah, the team. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah pay a couple salaries and then you know money's always a little short with smaller companies so it's sort of like well i guess i'm not paying myself <laughs> you know so yeah. i've never paid myself a salary and like even like all all sort of like skip my own royalties to make sure the artists are paid and things like that so you'll just keep putting in just to keep it alive yeah and keep it going yeah because it's also like you know, it's it in a sense like it's it is. I think it is good for me to have a label and to to be in a position where I can champion artists and do all these collaborations and events. And it's like a resource. Yeah, you just want sure. it to keep breathing and, and stay alive. Yeah, so you can keep. Be- I I make money DJing and you know remixing some of the records, bringing you know cash here and there and. I mean, the project, endorsements or whatever. That Project but, X money must have stayed for. Oh, no, I make nothing on Heads Will Roll. <laughs> you made nothing on Heads no, Will Roll? That's a, that's a flat fee, remix fee. I got paid a very small amount in 2009. Wow. wow. Shit. That's remixes. But you know, how many shows did he get on? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it would be nice because I heard it's triple platinum, but but uh, but no, um, there's. Oh my God. Does, I that think that's, that, that, does that piss you off? A little bit. No. Um, I mean,. <laughs> You're too nice. You're Canadian, of course. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, I'm. I'm sure there's like, there's opportunities to renegotiate sometimes, but like, <laughs> something like Hazel Roll has been like a huge calling card for me. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. but you know, I I do think that there's probably this perception from the outside where it's like, oh, he's got this big record and this label and da da da. I mean, like, you would think that, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but mm-hmm. but. Some of the records also, I mean, certain records have samples that take like all your publishing or this and that. Mm. So it's not, it's, everything's not as sweet as it looks. I also got the fucking worst sample lawsuit of my life during the pandemic while I wasn't working and I had to like shell out. Wait, what was that? I am not allowed to say. Oh my God. Due to the, the way that we settled it. <laughs> really? But I had to pay out a lot of money when, when there was no work in the Pando for an old sample for a record that was inconsequential a, a record that didn't even get big was it marvin gay people no okay <laughs> <laughs> so no, that's, you know. see, that's a scary one right yeah, there that's yeah. the one. <laughs> they went yeah. after ed sharon pharrell yeah. Yeah. Robin yeah. they're just sitting in the corner just waiting they're for just that, waiting for, waiting for that <laughs> song to blow to up <laughs> yeah and then all of a sudden we need to like it's time three, to collect, five years later time to, time just, to pay up hit them up <laughs> shit you know it's funny though like we have one of our uh one of our homies dj thando 
Yeah. Dando um, 88. He always speaks highly of you uh, as far as like the record label and stuff. He always, like, he signs singles to you, to mm-hmm. Fool's Gold and stuff. And he's always like, yeah, A Track always knows what to take out, what to change if he has an idea cool. and stuff like that. But he always speaks really highly of you as a record. I'm executive, I, I assume. That's the thing. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I really appreciate you helping dudes like that that really yeah. don't have no guidance opposed to just putting out records and shit. Yeah, I mean, and we, yeah, we're about to put out a new record of his that, that I think could do really well too. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, even to, look, this kind of touches on the stuff that I was tweeting about controversially a few years ago. Dondo's a club DJ primarily, right? right. Really skilled producer, very yeah. skilled producer. But He's put a lot of years in it. Yeah, really? um, yeah. yeah. But he doesn't even really have a manager. Now there's someone that's starting to help out. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the stuff that I was trying to talk about a few years ago was just me kind of observing. From my vantage point of, like, bouncing around different parts of the world and different sides of the scene and seeing all these all these subsections of the DJ world that had grown with a certain structure and noticing that like a lot of the club DJs either had like bad representation or no representation or were still kind of like didn't have kind of like you said that there wasn't much like mentorship, not, not a lot of like older DJs helping out the younger ones. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I was trying to comment on that one time saying like, yo, we need like, we need that same growth on an infrastructure level or a mentorship level to happen for this section of DJs, as I've observed in all these other um, sides of the world of DJing. But um, Thando's someone that's just really talented and, yeah. um, and um, you know, represents New York, definitely like our, our, our turf for Fool's Gold. <laughs> and, and so, you know, we love, um, we love putting his records out. You know, like, w- w- how do you look at DJing itself right now? Like, what is your favorite... Kind DJing's of, funny right now, man. It's like, kind, it's kind of a farce right now. Explain, explain. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. One thing that's really funny that I've observed is as like house and techno have infiltrated more parts of the world, mm-hmm. the shit that used to be the most kind of snobby and also the most credible, something like techno, for instance, mm-hmm. on some Instagram shit is now like kind of a farce. Like, there's literally, like, Instagram influencers who are playing, you know, types of techno that are supposed to be really, like, oh, you wouldn't understand this kind of music. And it's, like, everybody's just doing it for the look. And then there's shit that's supposed to be a farce, like like certain types of cheesy 90s dance that's now super popular that everybody's trying to do. So, like, there's this weird situation where, like, and even, like... <laughs> This whole side of like you're talking about like the Euro trance kind of stuff yeah. that's that's been like emerging. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm super down. Like, but you know, there's there there, you know, we have some upcoming. There's like eighty like better off alone like oh rendition. Right? Oh yeah, oh like leave that shit alone. Yeah. No, um, it's better off alone. Yeah, leave yeah. it alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every yeah. time I hear like four different songs Dude, come out. How many month. how many remakes of like after I'm blue? It's like now there's like yeah. ten remakes. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's just, <laughs> It's crazy. They're still doing remixes of Show Me Love. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but it's um, not as now it's like this whole Euro trance era. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm, and then the Barbie movie yeah. comes out. Yeah. I'm a Barbie yeah, girl. Yeah, yeah, Barbie yeah. Girl. All of this shit is coming back. Aqua making yeah. the comeback. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> even in my sets, I'm playing all of these like weird like Euro trance and it's like fitting in and it it's working in, in right yeah. now. Yeah, for sure. Like, so um, there's even like. Um, I mean, you know, even not to talk shit too much, but like, no, I, don't know if I, I want to hear, we <laughs> no, never but, get to hear, <laughs> no, but you hear track talk shit. I don't know if you've like, if you've ever seen like in Berlin, there's this thing called whore H O R, which is like a live stream from like this little room. It looks like a bathroom almost that has like these white tiles mm-hmm. and like all these DJs want to have a set on that thing. It's sort of like a boiler room, but like in a bathroom looking spot in Berlin yeah. and <laughs> it's supposed to be super prestigious and like. Look, I, I'm sure I'll play a set there one day, not knocking them, but like the circus of people who want to be accepted in that sort of credible techno scene mm-hmm. is has turned into like an ass kissing Instagram and TikTok heavy Take farce. Yeah. But don't you think that's everything now? Yeah. Because it's everything. Yeah. So, but to see DJing, like people still talk about certain types of like, supposedly underground house like you'll meet like 
if, even if you ask someone what they listen to, oh, I listen to Underground House, and they'll name DJs that are like some of the most famous DJs in the world. They're like, oh, I only like Underground shit. I like Solomon. Solomon's literally the biggest, like there's an article about him in the New Yorker. He's mm. probably, he's bigger than Tiesto. <laughs> and people will be like, oh, but he's Underground. And by the way, I love Solomon. I'm not knocking him, but like the, the sort of funny politics and cat and mouse games between what's cheesy and what's underground, everything's upside down and it's completely absurd. There's no reality anymore. So that's, that's one, like at least on the electronic side, that's what I'm seeing with DJing and it's but very funny. It's funny because after the pandemic, I noticed a couple of things, but I noticed exactly what you're saying right now. Mm -hmm. Is this like, um, it's like this nepotism, the politics have gotten worse. Yeah. It's like I, maybe after the pandemic, everyone's helping out friends. Mm -hmm. But then it just became like this thing of like, okay, this is how we're moving it for the next a, couple of years. It turns into a gatekeeper thing a little bit. Yeah, too. yeah. A little bit like a, like almost like a boys club, but not really a boys club. Yeah. But like, let's, let's just keep, these are the people we're fucking with, we've been fucking with, and yeah. then we're going to keep it this way. Even though sure. it doesn't necessarily works and it's not the best. It's just like, well, this is how it's working right now. Yeah. Yeah. So you're noticing, I'm, I've am i been noticing in every industry, like I talk to like everybody from like fucking plumbers to like, I don't know, like everything. It's kind of clicky, right? It's, yeah. It's getting kind of like that. And yeah. everyone's just kind of moving it. And it's be like, okay, this is how we're moving with business from now, like from now on. Yeah. And, and, you know, maybe some of that, like the economy's fucked and I think people are nervous about work. So I think like yeah. people get yeah. extra clicky when, when they're nervous. When about, times are rough. Yeah. 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 But, um, <laughs> it's not very good for the scene. No, no. I mean, yeah, DJing's in a weird place. Like you, you, you check out the Beatport top ten, and there's like, there's no consistency. There isn't like a, a sound, because people are like tech house turned into a farce. Everybody started making tech house records with like, <laughs> little <laughs> pseudo tropical Latin international right. words like just you know onomatopoeia tech like house. the Hugo like yeah. everyone's yeah. doing that right. sound right that, yeah yeah so that is is you know that's already sort of like okay next even though I love it so much yeah no Marinella <laughs> Tra Tra all that yeah. shit but how many ta -ta 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 records are you gonna get <laughs> I'll take another one man I'll take another one more one more, yeah. yeah. one more to go <laughs> alright like, one for the road <laughs> Do you, do you have an urge to just do like open format ever? It was like I was, we were like listening to like, um, like Four Color Zach, that kind of like aggressive, like hip hop, turntablist, open format, mixing, mixing with all that. Do you ever have an urge to do that? Yeah, I, I do sets like that sometimes. Um, I would love to hear that set. Yeah, when I've I, never heard you do that set. Oh, yeah. Ever. When yeah. I play, if I play a set that's mostly hip hop, it's definitely quicker mixing and more aggressive. Um, I don't know. Even the word open format is funny to me. Like, I, I think open format DJing is also just called DJing. Like, it's just sort of like... I mean, it's hip-hop, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's just the, the like, white nightclub way of saying hip-hop hip because yeah. they can't yeah. say hip-hop on a nightclub. Right, right. right. Well, that's saying funny, open yeah. format. Yeah. Before but, it was mashup. Yeah. And then, like, EDM hit. And then they were like, EDM's like, well, now we got, you know, hip-hop's popping right now. We got to bring it back in the club. And they're like, let's call it uh, open format. And that's when I feel like in the early 2010s, open format started emerging. That phrase started being like yeah. coining a hip hop. I mean, DJ. even, even yeah. you know, I feel like even in the AM heyday, that I feel like that's where I, when I was starting to hear that, really? that term. I was hearing mashup just everywhere. Yeah, okay. It was just mashup. DJ. Um, yeah, every, all the MySpace DJs were like, I'm a mashup DJ. Yeah. Like, yeah book right. me, book me. Right, I'm like right. AM, you know what I'm saying? I, yes. I don't know, my, my sets vary styles a lot, but I think I really got into, um, like once I, once I sort of like started figuring out the science of like having like three or four, you know, records mixing at the same time and like smoother transitions and like the whole like tension and release thing, I got addicted to that more than, than the quick mixing, mm -hmm. which is what I was doing before. Yeah. Like there's a certain, I don't know. I feel like it's almost like learning like a new way of cooking where you're like, oh shit, I, I can bake now. <laughs> it's, it's true. Like there was, there's a party in San Francisco called R&B and Ribs. Okay. And it's amazing. It's like this amazing R&B party. But I've noticed what makes their party so effective and great is these long transitions. Yeah. 
and it's like the quick mixing and the high energy like night when it's nighttime it's yeah. that seems to work best mm-hmm. but somehow during the day at their party these long transitions it just like makes you appreciate the music a little bit more yeah. and i was just like and i was looking at i was thinking about my style i'm like oh man can i do this i want to do some long transitions dude it's it's like it's, it's it's um it's validating <laughs> it yeah. pays, there's a payoff like for me the um i get really excited like going to listen to DJs who are really different from me. Mm-hmm. That's why I used to like to do Holy Ship because there's like you, you know that festival that's like uh, I've heard like about a rave it. Yeah, on yeah. A boat. I've heard it's about it. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a rave cruise. There's and it's, it's like groove cruise a little bit. Yeah, but yeah. it's like yeah, but with even better curation for DJs. Mm. And it had a run of many years where the lineups were great, and you're stuck on a boat for like three four days with like you know 60 great djs it sounds a little frightening it's a yeah. little fright it's a little bit like a zombie movie like the raver fans are a little crazy it's yeah, kind yeah. of literally like a zombie so wait movie. you're on the ship yeah yeah and you have to stay there yeah after like eventually they started allowing yeah. djs to leave after a day or two but like How i did, did like, like i by did a like, helicopter or something yeah, literally oh, or like you stop at an island in the bahamas and then people catch yeah. a flight off of there oh, but God. for the most part you're there the whole time wait how long is it how long three or four days it depends oh, okay okay i did 10 of them over the years. Wow. And that would be like DJ research for me. And I would just go and watch DJs that I don't usually see and just like check out, hang out their sets and and just try to like grab inspo kind of like you're saying, being like, oh man, I, I don't mix like that. What right. can I what can I take from this? Like just, you know, watching, I don't know, MK or someone like that or, you know, or, or even just if I'm playing a festival overseas, oh shit, let me go watch Felix the House Cat. Let me go watch, mm. you know, Carl Cox. What can I grab from that, you know? Because I'm, I'm so, I'm still at the root of me um, formed by hip hop. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I put in my hours listening to, to all the hip hop DJs. How often do you get a chance to do that though? Research and just go out and do that. Pretty often, you do. And even like I, I, you know, I go, I go watch my friends play. You know, if I'm, you know, I live in New York and LA, both. Yeah. yeah. Whatever city I'm in, someone's in town. I usually go to their shows. I mean, I'm, I'm go yeah. watch J Rock, get inspired. You really? Know? First, J Rock's my favorite DJ. Sure. You know, like I just go watch, but but also like, you know. Uh, even like even go watch fucking I'll go to one of Ellie Escobar's party in New York or just shit like that and just like oh, hang out for like two have hours have you been to Tiki Disco you know I haven't I still haven't I haven't either I yeah. need to go yeah. she looks amazing I know right God. and I'm so happy for Ellie cause that, that like he's like he's got such a loyal audience in New York he's just put it he's put, put the in the work years. in yeah, he's yeah. older than me yeah. yeah and he's just like stayed he's just stayed himself yep Throughout the years, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yo, HR, I don't want to keep you here too long, you know. So okay. I think we wait, 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 wait. Before we go, I have a uh-huh. fun story. <laughs> the first time I met Ed Trek, uh-huh. and my my childhood dreams were crushed. Uh oh. So oh, what'd you do to him? No, he doesn't know. Hey, Trek, what you did to him? What I, I was, do? I was, a, I was a young lad at a point, <laughs> and I saw a Trek while I was leaving the DJ AM documentary, uh, big night the at LA, the screening in LA. Uh huh. And I'm leaving. I just met everybody. I was like, wow, these guys are so nice to me. Mm. So it's a rough, that's a rough documentary. Yeah. yeah. It's, that, a, it's that, tough to watch. It, it yeah. kind of destroyed me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, same. But anyway, this destroyed me more. So <laughs> as I'm walking out, I'm with my sister. I was like, man, I just met all these people. Great. Da, 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 da. And I was, you know, up and coming DJ. And I see A-Track coming in. I was like, oh my God, this is fucking A-Track. I'm like, yo, can I get a picture? He's like, not tonight. Yeah, he, he just saw he this walks. horrific fucking dummy. And, he, and then he walks away, and I was like, oh, fuck. It's like Jordan telling you no, you know? I was uh, like, fuck. I was crushed. I'm sorry. I was sad. I, but I was it, just like, man, I, he probably has some other shit to do. I was like, I'm not mad at you, but I was like, so I crushing. usually say yes, so I, I had to really have been in my feelings after watching the movie. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah, yeah that was that was. And rough. then your jolly ass comes over. Yo, hey, Jack, let me get a picture. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, let me soak this shit in yeah, that I just fucking saw. Lunch. Yeah. I mean, that took a turn, man. I was like, I remember watching that shit and being like, yo, that was fucking heavy as fuck. Yeah. 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 Your jolly ass wants a yeah, picture. Yeah, you know me. You want to take a picture. You know, after, after seeing that movie, you, you want like, A-Track like this. Like, Cause, like, Cause <laughs> a lot of people don't, a lot, I don't think people remember and never brought this up earlier to me. You you kind of took over that role with Travis after he passed, right? Yeah, 
Did you catch any flack for that? I was wondering. That a shit. little bit, and that's, that's I stopped yeah. after a while. It was a little strange. It, oh, it, really? Yeah, yeah. Like who was who was giving you the flag? Who was uh, who was hating? Was it just DJs? Or? It, I, I mean, mean this uh, is, it it was more like just online, online comments. Like yeah, online Twitter chat. was like, oh, this should have just or just even people being like, oh, well, a- AM was better. No, A tracks better. Like I'm just like. I don't want to witness a com- like comparing me to my dead friend. Like this is weird. That's I don't. Like, it felt yeah. very uncomfortable. That's really ugly. So that's yeah. why you stopped working with Travis. No, it, well, it was kind of two things. So that in two thousand nine, Armand and I started Doc Sauce, mm-hmm. and Travis asked me to do some shows with him, and he asked me because uh, he said that AM had told him I was his favorite DJ, and, and I was like. All right, I can't say no to this. <laughs> um, but working with Travis, the guy's incredible. But also, he practices all the time, and every show required like days of rehearsals mm. and traveling with a whole crew. So it was a lot of work and a lot of time commitment. And then we did a couple shows, and then, like I mentioned, there was kind of some chatter around it that made me feel uncomfortable. Where I was like, I don't like how it feels to like just have this conversation comparing me to am he had just passed away um and uh i'm sure try- yeah i i'm trying to remember if it was 09 or 2010 but around then and i remember like getting to the point where it was like also just like my schedule was a little tough to manage and i felt like i should just choose one of these new collaborations and the duck sauce stuff was just like coming pretty easily it was right. fun mm-hmm. the travis shit was like one crazy time commitment like hey let's book another show can you come over to his house for 6 days to rehearse before like just kind of sacrifice anything else, else i had going on so the time commitment was tough the conversation around it was making me uncomfortable so after a few shows i was like i kind of respectfully bowed out like and I kept duck sauce. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's tough. Yeah, that's yeah. a tough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, w- I was, I was, you know, I was going at bat for you at the Twitter when okay. the other motherfuckers were trashing you. I was like, line, yeah, come on, line guys. motherfucker. <laughs> no, <I'm not. laughs> you were still mad about that no, picture. No, 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 the picture. <laughs> like, wait, what's your Twitter handle? <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the picture happened in 2015. This happened 09, 2010. So I was, okay. you know, I was a fan, bro. I was crushed. You know, uh, it happened. It happens. Yeah. yeah. A track. Thank you so much for coming through. Thanks. You know, Pleasure. You know, I feel like yeah. we've been trying to make this happened for a, for a while for a while for mm-hmm. sure and uh you know it's late night it's right after your gig yeah and, you know you know you're, you're in vegas and we're keeping you away from the festivities exactly, from, like right? the from raging, the horse from the, <laughs> ra- <laughs> from the horse the rhino <laughs> and the hippo <laughs> the vegas raging going on and stuff you know actually i would love to see uh a track raging yeah you know, right? <laughs> yeah and but, then go to the vinyl afterwards yeah mm-hmm. let's see what happens uh, it's vegas yeah. we'll see. he's like i don't know about no, it no, no, no. Young. <laughs> just make the flight at 11 a.m we'll be okay yeah. no but yeah we're real honored to have you yes. Pleasure. thank you Pleasure. so much Yo, bro. i appreciate it congrats to you guys for what you what you've built with this i don't know feels like it keeps getting bigger more i keep seeing more and more people talk about it yeah so congrats no i appreciate it's it great man. Yeah. And, and it was I, I, you know after i remember like recording the episode with you and rocticon yeah he's and never we were coming like, we're like he's never gonna come on this <laughs> <laughs> i was like yeah uh, he's never gonna come on this i'm like i told kirk i'm like kiss that one goodbye man <laughs> <laughs> no nah, nah, we're good if anything we had to sort of like do it right with an episode. Yeah. yeah, that one was a little strange. Like yeah, the, it was the a call little in strange. and the whole sort of like, why are we doing this? Yeah, yeah, I but yeah, ambush. <laughs> probably. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Luckily, we had Shecky behind the scenes. Like, yeah, pulling everybody. He's like, let's make this happen. This is you know. Let's he was probably having a great time. <laughs> yeah, he loved it. He loved, <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> he loved it. Yeah. Oh man, well, I don't have any issues with Rock. I don't even really know Rocktacon. I, 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 not, I can't. I'm not even sure if I've met him. He's like friends with some of my friends, and yeah. I'm just sort of like, why is this guy tweeting about well hopefully but. you'll meet him one day yeah. sure <laughs> or not, yeah i don't have any issues i i love him just because like you know he's just kind of a troll he's yeah. funny but he like wears this he's like the most authentic he's a slave to authenticity right uh like for better or for worse for yeah, better for for wherever worse. it takes him well yeah i get it so you know that's how he is but yo a track thank you for coming through yo a track yo thank you thanks, thanks guys yeah. If you want to watch more episodes from Road Podcast, click either links on the left or the right. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page and get updated on new uploads throughout the week. Peace.